Okay, then I'll introduce myself because I think my background is critical. <laughs> okay, it's in, it's, you can read it, but I'm a biophysicist. I earned my doctorate 40 years ago at University of California at Berkeley, and my specialty is actually looking at energy in relation to health, both um, the biofield, the energetics of the living organism, and how pollution, uh, electrosmog impacts health and wellness. So this is my field. And as 5G has been looming, I got very nervous about it because it's an escalation of what we've been seeing since uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G, which is the present generation of wireless. So I'm very passionate about this topic. And if you're here today, it's because you've taken the red pill. You really want to hear what's going on with this. And thank you for being here. So I liken Wi-Fi to smoke. Smoking was once considered glamorous, and even doctors recommended it for your health. These are some ads from the 40s and 50s. Uh, not only physicians, but movie stars were advertising tobacco and how great it was to simulate your circulation and, and a lot of other things. And of course, we know how fallacious those statements are. Smoking is not good for your health. Uh, in fact, it causes lung disease, things like cancer. So in some ways, wireless radiation associated with communication devices is the latest fad, uh, glamorous, and everyone wants it, and all devices are being made wireless, whether you want them wireless or not, because it's the thing to do. So it's quite similar. The only difference is you can't smell it, you can't sense it, but it's there, and it's doing things to you that are not healthy, and I'm going to talk about that today. So wireless may be considered the tobacco of the digital age in which we live. And we have an escalation of this technology. And I have a slide showing the progression. But here, here are some of the devices in our environment today. We have Wi-Fi uh, routers. We have computers that are wireless. Even if you're not using the wireless function, it's turned on and trying to communicate. We have smart meters that are blasting us with wireless. And they said they only do it intermittently. But if you put a meter next to it, you can see it's not intermittently. It's frequently. And we have, of course, cell phones, which have now become the major communication device. So, and it's only going to escalate exponentially as 5G comes in because they promise the Internet of Things. What does that mean? That means just about every appliance is going to be made smart, which means it's going to be wireless and communicating to a smart grid and your smart meter and hooked up to um, a whole control system where you can be endlessly surveilled. So 5G is the fifth generation of wireless. It's being sold to the American public or globally as being faster. So you can download your movie in just seconds instead of um, minutes. And it's got higher frequencies and a greater bandwidth. It has to have the big bandwidth because they expect billions of devices to go online. Billions. In other words, your toaster, your refrigerator, your stove, your washer dryer, everything in your house that's electric is going to be wireless. And that's called a smart device. It's very hard to buy an unsmart device. You go around and you want a new refrigerator or stove. They all say smart. And that isn't smart for you. That's smart for somebody else who's maybe going to surveil you. <laughs> but so the entire world, um, that means wireless World Wide Web. Now we have four Ws. That's what 5G is about. They want everybody on wireless. And you may say, well, but we're already on wireless. Well, not all countries are. Not all locations are. For example, national parks, if you go there, you can't get phone service, cell phone, and no, no Wi-Fi. That's a good thing. But now they want to make it available. That's going to probably throw uh, national parks and other national forests, et cetera, into ecological havoc because animals escape when presented with wireless. They move out. Where are they going to go? They're smart. They sense it, and they get out. So 50 billion things will be connected to the internet by 2020, according to the Hitachi Corporation. So everything you know, the industrial things, the consumer world of things, et cetera, all these things are going to be online and controlled, I suppose, via your cell phone. Also, self-driving cars. So here's the evolution of 
1G through 5G. We had 1G, the beginning of this, with rather clunky cell phones and towers back in 1996. And then low orbit satellites, um, 2G, 1998. Then Wi-Fi started in 2001, that's considered 3G. Then 2007, smartphones came aboard. So that's just 12 years ago. And now they're going to give us 5G, which is um, essentially an enhanced 4G plus more, plus more antennas and higher frequencies that actually have a lot more damaging effects on health and environment. What can this do? Well, faster speeds, self-driving cars, virtual and augmented reality. I'm familiar with virtual reality. I'm not sure what augmented is, <laughs> but you know, do we really need it? And the internet of things, whereby everything's connected. So that's what's coming. It's already, the rollout has already begun in certain cities in part like Sacramento, California, parts of Minnesota, and Shenzhen in China, and I've got some reports on those places to tell you later. So what is the infrastructure? Of 5G, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be a lot of hardware on Earth. The good thing is the fiber optic cables. Already they've strung these where I live. It's the big fat cable at the bottom there of the telephone pole, the fattest one. And fiber optics are really safe. I wish all of 5G were just going to be fiber optics. Fiber optics is a bundle of fibers like glass or plastic that convey light visible light inside the fiber. Now that's completely harmless and it's all inside a wire. So if everything were wired, it would be totally safe. But unfortunately, the last part from where that wire ends at the phone pole and your home will be wireless. That's the problem. Plus the satellites, which I'll talk about. So they're going to put in millions of small, so-called small cell antennas. Uh, they're not really small, that's just a name. And then they've got these power supplies which look sort of like mailboxes. And some of these will be strung up on these poles. But a dead giveaway of 5G antennas is this cylindrical look. Right now, you know, the 4G ones are little things placed 120 degrees around a pole. But this large cylinder that may be about six feet tall and on top of a telephone pole is a dead giveaway that it's 5G. And this really is just a shroud. In other words, it's uh, covering up the antennas underneath, which is a bunch of them. And then under that, they might have the power supply. They're going to hang these heavy things probably on the poles because lots of people don't want something this size uh, in their public right-of-way or on their easements because they have the right to put this on your easement according to some interpretations of the law, your property easement. So just like other utilities, they're considered a utility. So, so here's the other half of 5G. It's in space. Yes, they're planning on putting 42,000, that's the latest toll, 5G satellites. Right now, Earth has about 5,000 satellites, not for 4G or anything, but mainly for weather and uh, global positioning satellites, GPS. Uh, but now, 42,000 that are going to be blasting the Earth so that every square inch of Earth will be reaching, uh, getting the frequencies. And there's going to be no place to go if you have sensitivity. And what about the animals? What about the plants? What about the microbial life on Earth? All questions that have not, never been really discussed before this thing is coming aboard. That's a serious problem in my view. And who are the companies going to do it? Well, Elon Musk's SpaceX and Amazon and a smaller company called OneWeb. You can look them up. They're proud. They say, um, you know, you look on their websites, uh, we're going to cover you wherever you are. That's one of their, their logos. <laughs> so, and so it was 1957 when the Earth had the first uh, satellite, that was the Sputnik, fired from Russia. Some of you are old enough to remember that, like me. Oh, yeah. and, and the Earth was naked except for one satellite. And then by 1993, uh, Earth had many more. And I mean, 2018, from a bird's eye view, Earth is loaded with satellites, and now it's going to get much worse. So we're actually probably going to change the whole ionosphere of the planet by this launch of satellites that may bust through the, uh, the delicate membrane of the Earth, the upper ionosphere membrane, and then be hovering in space uh, for the rest of time until they need replacement. 
So 12,000 of these satellites have already been approved by the Federal Communications Commission. That's the FCC. It's part of the federal government. And they're really the only ones overseeing this whole 5G. Who is the FCC? It's a group of about six people, most of whom came from the telecom industry. There's no physicians. There's no scientists. It's a bunch of business guys, and they seem in cahoots with the industry. So there's kind of a race for 5G. President Trump has said, we've got to move ahead because the Chinese are doing it, and we've got to do it first, part of the campaign to make America great again. I like the idea of making America great again, but I have to say, and I've been to China several times in the last several months, and I think they're way ahead of us. So Huawei is the Chinese telecom, the large company that's making about $500 billion a year, and they have already much cheaper chips that will do 5G. And now the question is, do we use their chips or do we make our own? Because um, if we use their chips, maybe the Chinese can spy on us. That's one of the arguments against Huawei. Uh, but countries are signing on to Huawei because, hey, they've got it done. It's ready to go, and it's going to be less expensive than US chips. So I'm afraid the race has been lost. Uh, Chinese won, and I wish we would back down and stop trying to race on most on Argumet, Argumet and, whoops. Um, so it's going to bring in trillions of dollars, so say the economists, and the federal government then has mandated a fast track. We've got to roll this stuff out quickly. That's the game. And there are some interesting laws on the books, that federal laws. Uh, I was very surprised to learn that President Clinton signed a bill into law called the Wireless Communications Act of 1996. That was just when Wi-Fi was getting going, and hardly anybody had it yet. But this law is really a strange one, and you can see it was put together by the lobbyists representing big telecom. It prohibits our local governments from considering health effects when considering proposed wireless installations. So it's actually saying you don't have any jurisdiction, local governments, to discuss health and environment. Trust us, this stuff is good for you. We're going to dish it out. And you just have to think about design issues and the color of the antenna. And to some extent, the placement of the antenna, if you think it's in a dangerous intersection or something. That's the only thing local government can do according to federal law. Now, there's a lot of contesting going on in various lawsuits around the country because people have been riled up and don't want these installations and have bugged their local governments. We're not going to take this. And what can you do for us? So some of the towns have sued the federal government about this, and also the FCC ruling. Now, as I said, the FCC is a committee of about six people. Who the heck are they to make rulings to tell the states and cities what to do? Again, that's been challenged in federal court by local communities. So you can't tell us what to do. But <clears throat> they're saying the FCC is in charge of this whole thing. You have to do it. It's on a fast track. And you don't have time to review all those antenna permit applications that roll into the city planning commission. Because thousands of them are rolling in. And I'm involved in Oakland, California, where, OK, so maybe 5,000 antennas are going to come to Oakland, California, two residential and school areas. And originally, we were reviewing them. And the, and the city was doing diligence. But now, because so many have rolled in, and there's a <clears throat> A fast track, you've got to get them all reviewed by, I guess it was January or February this year. They just started rubber stamping them and not even reading them. So that's what happened. That's what the fast track is about. Because the FCC said so. You have to do it, you have to do it quick, and nobody has time to review it. So rubber stamp, and it's all a done deal. That's what happened, at least in my community. It's not a pretty picture. Now here's something that I learned, looking more deeply. How do laws like this 1996 Telecom Act even come into being? Well, you probably heard about lobbyists, but then I learned about this organization that's kind of uh, an intermediary. It's called ALEC, A-L-E-C, the American Legislative Exchange Council. How the industry captures government agencies. So even beyond the 5G issue, how pharmaceutical industries may do it, how agrochemical industries may do it, there's this group called ALEC, and they're financed in part by big business, including big telecom. And big corporations who have agendas, who want to manipulate the federal government or legislation, put money into ALEC, 
and then Alec does the work for them and gets lobbyists going who write the laws, and then they push it on the legislators that have been, whose campaigns have been funded by um, big business, who then uh, feel like they owe or maybe they promise to do uh, this sort of thing for those companies. And so that's how it all works. It's, the government has been captured by industry. And if you think about that, that's fascism, even though we're not calling it. We have a fascist state, seems to me, when, when we have a corporatocracy, when the corpor big corporations are somehow intervening um, and their interests get served above that of the whole, the people. Uh, so that's the situation we're in. And Alec is, you probably never heard of it. I just looked into this and discovered it. So it's an intermediary that um, is really greasing the axles of Washington and legislatures and probably other local governments too. So there's this fast track rollout of 5G mandated by the FCC. 60 to 90 days they had to get going on local review of permits, so that meant just rubber stamping them in most communities and that means you know, no review wherever they're gonna go. They're gonna go and that's it and, and the people well, in Oakland, the industry was getting many minutes to speak at the Planning Commission, and the people got 60 seconds. Each person got 60 seconds to speak out if they had a problem with a particular permit application. So the, the unfairness of uh, this whole uh, issue being raised in government was quite clear to me. There's another law in the books that would save our behinds. It's called the National Environment Policy Act, or NEPA, created in 1969. And it's still legal. It requires environmental review. But then we can ask, where is the environmental assessment and impact statement for this drastic change coming to planet Earth? It hasn't been done. So right now, there's a lot of people invoking NEPA. For example, the Native Americans, who don't want these things going on their sacred lands. So I'll say a little bit more about that later. But it seems to me we need to be invoking the laws in the books that protect us and not just these other laws that seem to undermine. And the contradiction between laws is also an interesting thing to note. But 2020 is the target date for 5G rollouts. So some of us, like myself, have gotten really concerned about getting the word out so people can uh, take action in their local communities and, and even um, against the federal government who have made such dictums that are impossible for us to work with locally. And what does 2020 mean in terms of 5G rollout? It means all the hardware will be rolled out. In other words, we can expect uh, 5G antennas to be placed in our communities, near our schools. 5G satellites uh, put into space. Looks like they're all being launched out of Florida. 5G routers, which will be in our homes unless you choose not to have one. 5G smartphones, of course, it's a matter of choice. You can stick to a 4G phone. But all of that is coming and um, then, of course, the software and applications to run it. So why really is 5G different? <clears throat> well, as I said, it's the real wireless world without limitations, total coverage of the planet. And that means millions of antennas and thousands of satellites beaming frequencies covering the entire Earth and much more extensive because, as I said, the Internet of Things will demand that everything is connected to the Internet, to the network. As you're going to see in a little video that I'm going to play, 5G is not broadcasting, which means you have an antenna that broadly makes waves, sort of like throwing a stone in water and the waves move outward. 5G is a, like a little laser beam going bzz, 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 high, high uh, intensity beams that are blasted toward the users every millisecond and maybe going through your body or through your home in order to reach your neighbor's home. Uh, so the, just to, the way it's uh, functional is incredibly different from broadcasting. It's a phased array. I have a little video to show you. I'm going to get to the frequencies and just hang on. I've got a lot of slides on that. And absolutely, let me tell you something. Right now, 4G Wi-Fi, which we're using if you have Wi-Fi, is 2.4 gigahertz. Did you know that's exactly the frequency that your microwave oven makes? In other words, it's the frequency that water absorbs. That's how food cooks in a microwave. So why on earth would anyone pick the same frequency that kills microbes, that thwarts life, to use it for delivering your Wi-Fi? Does it make sense? Absolutely not. 
there's a whole spectrum of frequencies, and they take the most disgusting life negative frequency to blast everywhere in schools, and, and that's the Wi Fi we have now for those who have Wi Fi. You don't have to have Wi Fi, and I can give you resources on how you can get rid of it and have internet later. Okay, so. So the 5G network is more extensive because everything will be connected. As I said, they want everything connected. And if you think, I'm never going to get a smart appliance. Well, if you need a new stove or refrigerator, that's your only choice. It's sort of like a new car. I, I would like an analog car, please. I grew up on them. I want another one. There are no more analog cars. You, want, you have to get a computerized car that is blasting you with all kinds of radio frequencies. And that's your only choice if you want a new something. So this is the world in which we live. So they're moving focus beams of higher power. I'll, I'll show you a video so you know how that looks. And here's another thing. This whole band of 5G used to be used by the military. In other words, they gave it up now for civilian use, including weapons were running on it. The 95 gigahertz beam uh, band is uh, the act of denial weapon. What does that mean? The military shines this on a crowd that they want to disperse. And it makes your skin burn, so you run like hell. And the crowd uh, disperses. That's what 95 gigahertz does. And that's the upper band of 5G. The other bands of 5G are radar, military radar. And there's a lot of literature that shows how bad that is for their health. Because the military men had problems from radar bands. And, and it's, um, I can point you to some of that research. So. And then the last thing here, only very expensive military-grade instruments can measure the highest frequencies of 5G. In other words, if you want a meter to say, well, how am I getting exposed here, good luck. It'll cost you $150,000. That's how expensive it is. So the public will not be able to monitor their environment. And they'll have to rely on the industry to do it. And do you trust the industry? No. We can't trust the industry. The studies funded by the industry are also warped and inconclusive compared to independent studies by independent scientists. So uh, the city said, the industry will measure it. Oh, we can't trust the industry. So, but there are some solutions coming to that too. So here's the difference between broadcasting and beamforming. This is how standard radio stations and cell phone towers presently work. So it's a wide angle. And literally, it's cast broad. But 5G is going to work on what's called phased array antennas that have extremely narrow pencil beams of high intensity. And they're going to go out, and every millisecond, <laughs> so they're going to be buzzing all over the place and intersecting. And, and the engineers who write about it are concerned that, well, you know, the Internet of Things may be problematic because everything's hooked up, and you're going to have all these signals. Maybe it won't work. That's what they're talking about. If you read the engineering literature, they're concerned that there are so many signals going to be deployed that they're concerned about the crosstalk. That's what they write about. Nobody's writing about the health and environment in that world. Amazing, totally amazing. But they're engineers. They're not trained in biology or medicine. So you've got these pencil-thin beams, like a laser beam coming out. That's the beam forming of 5G. Here's a little bit more technical. Uh, you've got a near field and a far field. Um, so it's going to have also side lobes. That's another thing. So the beam is going straight ahead, but there's also uh, beams around it that are, when, uh, when you have many of these things happening, all going to add up and make you more exposed. And the near field will be very strong. That means if you're near one of these emitters, like a phone pole outside of your bedroom window, because the antennas are going to be approximately at the second or third floor level, Imagine the strength of that now coming into your home where you spend a lot of time, like sleeping in bed or a home office on the second or third floor. So that's what we're facing. Now here's my little video, and I'll try to click on it. Oh yeah, that's going to work. Wireless service providers continuously strive to increase network capacity to serve more subscribers with higher capacity. However, service providers operating in 3.5 gigahertz licensed bands are challenged by lack of spectrum and the moderate capacity of existing WiMAX point-to-multipoint systems. 
Service providers operating point to multi point and license except bands also find it hard to deliver SLA due to the adverse effects of signal interference from third party systems. Looking to redefine the performance of broadband wireless access, Radwin 5000 Jet, a point to multi point solution with disruptive smart beamforming, was introduced to the market. Jet beamforming solution is formed from an array of antenna elements that are combined to generate a narrow and steerable beam for increased system gain, ultimately boosting capacity and range. Interference immunity is greatly improved as a result of replacing the wide beam of common sector antennas with a narrow beam. Together with Radwin's unique air interface, JET assures SLA services in noisy spectrum where conventional solutions fail to operate. In typical point to multi point deployments with a wide beam antenna, adjacent beam sectors mm. overlap, creating a high level of self interference that reduces user capacity. Frame my videos. Typical yeah. sector antennas, JET narrow beam reduces self interference between adjacent sectors and nearby sites to a minimum, achieving greater network capacity through unmatched frequency reuse. When line of sight conditions are compromised, JET smart beam forming antenna automatically chooses the optimal beam direction for the best link over a reflection or diffraction path, empowering service providers with wider coverage and better infrastructure utilization. Well, you got the idea, even if some of that wasn't clear uh, visually, but these narrow beams um, will be very strong, and they'll be intermittently passing through you and the biosphere around you. Now, let's see, how do I go on to my next slide here? Okay, so, huh, okay, this is a little too technical, so I'm going to move ahead. So here's something um, that I want to point out. According, in nature, we have virtually no microwaves. Uh, the level is very low. These are decibel measurements, kind of um, 1.8 picowatts per square meter. That's our exposure in nature. Right now, most cities in America are in this range. For example, just walking through the streets of San Francisco with my 4G meter, I measure levels like minus 35 decibels, uh, which translates to 18 nanowatts per uh, square centimeter. Now you may say, well, nanowatts, it's still very little, but it's millions of times greater than background net natural radiation. In other words, the sun is not blasting us with microwaves, nor are the stars. S stuff coming from space, the natural radiation, the background radiation is nil in the microwave region, and now we're already millions of times above background with what we have from 2G, 3G, and 4G. We're in this area that the bio biologists, the building biologists, called um, extreme anomalies and uh, beyond severe anomalies. And our thermal limit, which is the FCC's regulatory level, ceiling level, is up here. Um, it's 5.8 watts per meter squared. And we have the highest limit in the world, along with Canada. Countries like China, Pardon me, China, Russia, and Switzerland have levels that are 100 to 1,000 times lower than the United States. And yet, when we go there, and I've been to those places, our phones work perfectly well. So, again, we just have it stronger and more, and that's kind of an American way that we make it bigger. Yeah? What does the term, <coughs> pardon, what does the term thermal limit mean? I'm going to get to that. What that means, uh, but I'll tell you right now. Uh, our government accepts the idea that only tissue heating is important. Uh, if we don't heat your tissue, then there's no other effects. Let me tell you how they do that. They have this mannequin that's like a head and shoulders stuffed with physiological saline, salt, a salt inside the head. They, put, they strap a cell phone out where it would be on the mannequin, and then they have a thermometer in the center of the head. And they turn on the cell phone and they say, they look and see, does the thermometer show increased temperature? That's the only effect they're looking for from a cell phone strapped to your head. And that's called the thermal limit. OK, now, they know that everything over that will really heat your tissue. But the problem is there are many more biological effects at very low levels. And that's all called non-thermal effects. Not about tissue heating. Even if you put a cell phone in your head, you'll feel your ear gets warm, right? People do. 
But that's not the real biological effect. The real biological effects are, are aggravating all of the little oscillators inside our body, all of the little delicate reactions that are oscillating, including your brain waves, your heart waves, and all the other things that go on. We are energy beings. We are electrical. And that's what our government will not acknowledge as a biological effect. It's incredible. When other countries have acknowledged it, we're operating on physics of like 30 years ago in terms of the review of this. And again, the industry has corrupted the science to the point where that's where we're stuck. Uh, so, but I'll say more about that later. But this chart is very telling uh, where we are. And I've been to China. I've measured the background. Now, I noticed in China, lots of people live in these high-rise apartment buildings, say in Beijing. And we took our meters around. And then you see these uh, cell phone antennas right next to their apartments. And walking around there, I was surprised, that, yet it wasn't that high radiation compared to San Francisco. Because we have a higher limit that's like uh, 100 or 1,000 times higher than China. And so our antennas are blasting us more, even though they may be further away from our homes. But now with 5G, they're going to be right up next to our homes. So that's what's coming. And we have to be very concerned about this. So, OK, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Now let's talk about where are these frequencies of 5G. First, this is the spectrum of all the radiant energies that are electromagnetic that we know of in physics. So they range from ELF, extremely low frequencies like what would be brain waves, all the way to gamma waves, gamma rays from outer space. And down here are the lower waves, the so-called radio waves. So microwaves, broadcast, and uh, millimeter waves right here are part of uh, 2G, 3G, and 4G. 1G is already gone. OK, above that is terahertz. Here's where that scanner in the airport where you do this which I never get in, by the way, because I know how it unravels your DNA. Uh, that's where the terahertz scanners are in the airport. And then above that, you have the so-called ionizing radiations, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, et cetera. Now, we, it's been well accepted in conventional science that all of this is hazardous. I mean, beyond visible light, at least. Ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays will ionize biomolecules and thwart you. When you go in for an x-ray at the dentist, they cover your thyroid with lead so that they don't hit your vital organs. So we know that this causes biological effects. What they don't admit to is that these things do the same. But um, at low levels, even, they also do similar ionizing things. Uh, yet they're called non-ionizing radiation. And there's a lot of evidence that it causes free radicals in living things. So we're talking about this region. And then let's get more detailed. Now, here's another thing. Um, we live in the digital age. And what does that really mean in terms of these waves? That's very different from analog. The sun is analog. Life is analog. Everything that is an ordinary thing is analog. That's the natural world. When we moved into the world of computers, we're using digits like 1 means turned on, 0 means turned off. That's what digital is. So it's always going on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And there's a lot of peaks and then gone. And that's how the signals are. Analog signals are continuous waves, soft, continuous waves like water waves or uh, sine waves. Uh, so, but now we're operating in digital, and they're pulsed. There's nothing in nature that goes on, off, on, off. It's analogous. If I stand near the light switch and go on off, 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 you would say, stop. I can't stand it. Your brain can't adapt to it. That's what we have with digital waves. And our government's trying to tell us, let's consider the average of all of that. In other words, if I go on off, on off, and off, there's a way of calculating the average light intensity in the room. But it's, it's not a meaningful value, because you, as a biological organism, experienced the on and off, and then the on and off and on and off. You didn't experience the average intensity of light in the room. If you did, you could have adapted. But you've experienced this amazing pulse wave train that you can't adapt to. So that's the falsity of the argument in the FCC and the government. They're looking at the average. Uh, radiation instead of the wave train 
the actual wave train to which we are exposed is more meaningful biologically than the average intensity to which we're exposed. But when you talk about thermal, you only talk about the average. You talk about how much heating is going to happen as a result of signal, whatever the signal is. You see, so that's how false the science is that's been accepted as conventional science. It has no biological meaning. And, uh, and we have nothing in nature that is digital and pulsed. All analog sources are sweetly like this. And also, the sun, when it reaches the Earth, is a spectrum of frequencies from infrared and peaking around uh, green and then coming down into a little bit of ultraviolet, etc. That's what life is used to on Earth and what we depend on for health. Sunlight is good in moderation. Again, they've scared us into thinking the sun is bad for you. Wear this plaster, put on these shades, etc. It's false arguments, really. Uh, go read Ott on sun, and you'll learn a lot more about how life needs light. So, so let's. Uh, we did some work. My husband Harry Jabs is uh, a gifted engineer, and we um, we prepared some graphs to show you this. Uh, so here's FM radio. Now, a radio is not a problem. Why? Because the ra there's a radio tower. Unless you live near that tower, you have a radio receiver, but it's not actively emitting frequencies. It's just receiving. That's how radio is. It's not dangerous. You can put it near your head. It doesn't matter. Uh, but nobody puts it near their head. But anyway, OK, this is what's called a waterfall effect, where we look at the major radio stations in San Francisco, uh, then look pretty continuous. Uh, they're pretty analog, but they're modulated. FM means frequency modulated, and AM means amplitude modulated. So that's the meaning of those words. But they're, they're still continuous signals. They're not pulsed. We've been living with radio waves for a long time. Even though there are some effects, you don't want to be near an antenna, uh, a radio broadcasting station, but it's still analog waves. Now, I want to talk about other technology in our environment that blasts us as well with digital waves. And one is the decked phones. The decked phones, decked means digitally enhanced cordless telephones. Many people have these as their landlines. I don't recommend them. They are greater emitters than your cell phone. And they're sitting there right there in your home, often on your desk. And here's the thing about them. They are emitting all the time, whether you use them or not. Even if the phone is off, it's blasting you. And we measured the signals from these. Now, this particular deck phone even has a wire like this in one part. And then it's got satellites that, uh, but in the measurements we made, we did not use any satellites. We only used this, which looks wired and has an associated answering machine. It's what you can buy. If you go out to look for a landline, you're not going to find a totally wired phone anymore, unless you go to an estate sale or an antique shop. They don't exist. So you get this, and you think, this looks reasonable. I want a wired phone. Now, um, the phone is turned off, and we get nothing. Now, the phone is turned on. Now, actually, the phone is now plugged in, and we get bands. Uh, and nobody's using the phone. The phone is is constantly emitting uh, radiation. It's what's called, um, here's another one. Um, this is a router, a Wi-Fi router. This is the 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz or 24 megahertz, and it's digital. It's always emitting, and this is the structure of the radiation. So it's constantly bleeping every so often. Um, and there's no users. It's just sitting there, and it's constantly sending out radiation, even if you're not using it. So here's how these devices work. They use something called a polling mode. It's like it's always looking for an event, a user saying, are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. It's sending out a signal, probing whether it's going to get something back. And the wireless things are always on, whether you're using them or not. And nobody knows about this. And when we've tried to disable Wi-Fi modems, you know, we'll come to somebody's house. We don't want Wi-Fi anymore. We've got health problems. We understand. We want to do the old Ethernet uh, DSL cable. And a lot of modems still have this, uh, routers, they have, still have this kind of cord that you can stick in. But the problem is, how do you disable the Wi-Fi on it? Because even if you think you disable the Wi-Fi, then there's the uh, additional Wi-Fi, uh, what is it, uh, in the environment for people who happen to be wandering by. 
uh, so-called hotspot that you have to also disable, or maybe impossible to disable. But anyway, these digital devices are constantly sending a signal looking for a handshake. And are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? Every uh, 10 times a second or more, they're sending signals, including your smart meter. Yes, they said, oh, it's not going to be. It's all rarely on. It sends signals at the end of the day. No, no, it's always on. You can put a meter near there and see this. Yes. Now, we want instead. They could have made devices like this based on the event mode. When you say you want a hookup, then it could respond. But no, they didn't make them like that. I'm sorry to say. They made them polling mode. All of them are like this, constantly blasting us. So if you want to clean up your environment locally, then you have to get rid of your decked phones, or you have to do what we call a lobotomy on them. And we have instructions how you can do your, low, your phone lobotomy to remove the wireless. If you want them, I can give them to you. It's not difficult, but you've got to know what to clip when you uh, open the phone. There's a little wire to clip. So I want to show you the oscilloscope analysis of the signals from Wi-Fi and cell phones. And we have all of this equipment. So Harry rigged an RF detector. It was called a breadboard. That's sort of a prototype, as engineers do. And he's got an antenna. And then we put the cell phone or the uh, device near there and uh, some of the hardware that he rigged, and then hook up to the oscilloscope so we can see what is this thing really emitting in terms of signals. Now, here's a structure of digital pulses coming from wireless. So we have a wireless pulse. This is the polling mode. And every tenth of a second or so, it's sending out a signal. And you know, biologically disrupting you, because nobody can adapt to these, these digital pulses. So then we blew up one of these to take a look. Blown up 100 times. And it looks a very abrupt, sharp pulse. Then we blew it up even further, and we could see the actual ones and zeros inside the pulse. So that's what's going on. It's incredible uh, to which we're exposed. So this is like the guts of the matrix of, 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 um, of the wireless world around us, the structure of the digital pulses. And it's happening all the time. No, but there was a paper by Dr. Alan Fry 40, 50 years ago that showed at certain intensities, some people can hear microwaves. Now, it's not actual hearing. Your ears are not responsive. So ears only hear sound. But it stimulates the temporal lobe. That's part of the brain that does hearing. The temporal lobe is just behind the ears. So there's direct voice to skull. And the military uses that to torture people. Yeah, they can send microwaves in your head, and then you hear the apparent voices uh, of whatever. They modulate it to make it meaningful. So that's the kind of strange things that can go on with microwaves. Yeah. So here are some. Then I took the smartphone, and I started doing things to it, putting it near the antenna. So I had a stored video on my phone. I made a video of, what was it, my hens uh, marching around. And so a stored video on the phone caused uh, again, uh, peaks and troughs, and here's the polling mode coming up. And then I made a call, and then we saw this. Uh, and this is, uh, let's see, 500 milliseconds uh, just here. And these are intense peaks that then come out in the cell phone region. And then I played a YouTube video, and that got a little stronger because now I'm relying on internet communication. And you can see a lot of things. This is the same time period. And then I played a different video and got a lot more action on the phone. So it just shows you that your phone is constantly emitting a barrage of digital signals on and off, on and off, on and off. And that you're constantly exposed to this if you're holding the phone or putting it in your pocket. Uh, if your phone is not on smart mode, you are being exposed. It is constantly communicating with your provider or with Wi-Fi, whatever you've got on. And uh, that's not anything you, your body can adapt to. It's a stressor. When your smartphone is on airplane mode, it's off. There's nothing. This is just noise because we amplified it. This is just noise. That's the only way to turn your phone off. Or you could take the battery out. In some phones, you can't do that, like the iPhone. So airplane mode is actually more off than turning your phone off. If you turn your phone off, it still communicates with the GPS satellite. And I know this because when I traveled in Europe, and I thought my phone was off, every time we'd go over between Austria and Germany, ah, the cell phone told me you're now entering Germany. 
And here, if you want to uh, get connected, here you go. Just as soon as we went over the state line, and my phone was off. Well, it ain't off because it's communicating with GPS. And therefore, it's constantly polling and sending me signals. So you don't want to have your phone off. It ain't off. It's not a hard off. You have to uh, put it on airplane mode. That's the real off. And few people know that. And so I constantly keep my cell phone on airplane mode. And then when I want to make a call or text, I turn it on for a moment, do what I need to do, and turn it right back, back on airplane mode. And then it's a brick. You can put it in your pocket safely. You can put it in your body, and it's OK. But few people do this, because they want to be connected all the time at the risk of ruining their health. That's amazing. A Gau Gauss is magnetic field. And we're measuring, this is different. This is radiant energy. Magnetic fields are not radiant. Well, yes, they radiate, but it's, it's a different kind of energy. There's electric meters, there's magnetic meters, and then there's electromagnetic meters, and they're all different. Well, again, there's associated magnetic fields, but the primary driving field is, is a radiant energy field, is an electromagnetic field, and it's rays coming through the sky. And that's different from a, a magnetic field that's generated by moving parts or motors or an associated electric field. So 5G frequencies are numerous, and they're going to start at sub-6 uh, gigahertz and extend up to about 90, 95. Um, and each continent on Earth uh, is going to have a slightly different one, but they're going to overlap so that our cell phones and our technology will be useful in different regions of the Earth. Here's uh, an amazing chart of the United States allocations of the radio spectrum. I know you can't read this, but I just wanted to show you how many users there are in terms of like Navy intelligence or uh, ships or uh, airplane radar and, and how now the FCC, who dices out the spectrum and assigns it, had to work very carefully to assign uh, new territory to civilians, that's us, of the spectrum. And then blown up, you see more detail. But here, uh, blown up even further, are the 5G allocations. So you can see how numerous they are. 5G is going to involve a lot of the uh, radio frequency spectrum. And the radio frequency, that word is a broad name for all these uh, invisible waves that um, were discovered around the time. We call them radio. It really means radiant. Um, but uh, you can see there's numerous bands of 5G. So then that makes it much more complex than 4G, or 3G, or 2G, because 4G basically had one frequency to send out, another one to receive, and then one frequency for Wi-Fi. So 5G has a lot of different waves and a, a, an enormous span of the radio frequency spectrum from about 6 gigahertz to 95 gigahertz. It's huge. Yeah. I think it'd be better to have questions at the end, or unless you have a burning question of, to clarify what I'm saying. Just, just you stated that China and other countries uh, are much lower tolerant. Well, China will use the same kind of bands. They're just going to use it at lower intensities, uh -huh. just so you understand. It's, we're all having similar bands, overlapping, because uh, you, know, you want your thing to work in China when you go there, and vice versa. But it's all about lower intensities. We have higher intensities. In other words, like the volume is turned up, so to speak. Volume relates to sound, but intensity is what we call these signals. You can crank them up, higher amplitude, or you can crank them down. So that's the difference. We have, again, the same span of frequencies all over the world. 5G is going to look the same. Uh, slight differences. Here are the bands for the United States, some of which are still unlicensed. The FCC is still deliberating who's going to buy this band or that band. In other words, Verizon may buy a little peak here and AT&T over here and uh, you know, T-Mobile, the, the various companies. And they may also collaborate. Because can you imagine if you've got uh, 5G antennas that are expensive, and then you've got a different one for Verizon, a different one for AT&T, and a different one for T-Mobile? You're going to have three sets of antennas outside your window because your neighborhood uses all three providers. I mean, that gets crazy. So they're going to share antennas. That's what I think. Otherwise, the expense is enormous. The infrastructure expense of putting up millions of antennas and 42,000 satellites is enormous. And yet, I hear, sometimes I hear the Greens saying, you know, this is going to be good because it uses less energy. 
oh my God, are they considering the total carbon footprint of this operation in terms of the materials, the refining, the tossing in of your 4G phone, the getting of the new phone? You know, that is such a carbon footprint that nobody's calculated it. So I mean, where is their brain when they say it's going to be low energy? Hey, you got to take into consideration the entire system of hardware and software and energy delivery, and also the energy to launch all these satellites and what that's going to do to the atmosphere. Nobody's made a calculation of that. I don't see an environmental impact report. Why not? Again, on the law, the 1969 NEPA law, we should have had that already. It isn't happening. Unbelievable. So few people know about that law, as it turns out. So these are our bands uh, coming with 5G. There's a lot of them. And it's much more detailed. And it gets into these millimeter waves. And those have dire health effects. Now, here's a fact from bioelectromagnetics. <clears throat> that all life forms can sense exquisitely tiny fields. And it isn't thermal, it's, it's deeper. It has to do with the little rhythms inside the cells, the oscillations on a membrane or in your brain waves and your heart and beyond. So even when the signal is smaller than physical thermal noise, what does that mean? That means the thermal motion of molecules. That is an incredible sensitivity. That's like saying the eye can see a single photon, a single particle of light. And an organism can sense a signal when it's like a molecular vibration uh, less than thermal noise. I mean, it's an exquisite sensitivity. That's what we are as organisms. How is that known? Because it's been tested. We can make signals that are like picotesla strength, and then we expose cell cultures, et cetera, and we see shifts in uh, genetics, uh, genetic expression, or in the activity of, let's say, cultured neurons or, or monitoring animals in vitro. So it's known by laboratory experiments. Now, here's what we see in the real world. We see children holding cell phones to their head, or sometimes people wearing Bluetooth or even strapping their cell phone to their head. It, it's bizarre. In other words, there's a love affair with cell phones. And everywhere you go, you see somebody pecking away like a chicken uh, at their cell phone, uh, mesmerized by it. And that's how the world works, 7 billion strong. And there are about 8 billion people, so almost one to one. And what happens when you put a cell phone to your head? What does that look like in your brain waves? It looks like an electromagnetic storm. It looks like epilepsy. Of course, you don't have epilepsy, not yet. But if you keep holding a cell phone to your head, you're training your brain waves to do more and more incoherent behavior. And you know with training, whether it's bio, that's a kind of biofeedback, but this is more of an entrainment thing. You put something near your head, and this, this uh, figure shows the penetration of the microwaves. It isn't tissue heating. The five-year-old has a very thin skull. It turns out it's half a millimeter, almost like an eggshell. And the radiation penetrates almost the entire brain. And yet we're allowing children to hold these things to their head. Or they work with them in schools as tablets and wireless computer, where they have industrial strength Wi-Fi, and where we've measured that they're getting over the legal limit of what is considered the guideline in the United States. The 10-year-old, it penetrates less. Their skull is one millimeter thick. The adult has a two millimeter thick skull. So it's a little better, but still you've got brain penetration. And um, that isn't tissue heating. That's, that's deeper effects. There is tissue heating. People, this is thermography where you see what happens after a 15-minute uh, cell phone call. But this is all surface, mainly. And nobody's worried about your ear heating up. Although, oh, it's interesting. The, the uh, government is now considering the ear uh, an appendage, like a hand. So it doesn't matter that it gets heated, even though there are more acoustic neuromas. There are tumors happening right inside the ear as a result of uh, phone use here, and also salivary gland tumors. And we never saw these before cell phones. They were unheard of. That's, those are new diseases. Now, beyond tissue heating, here's another danger about the non-thermal effects. Wireless damages the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a special membrane that prevents certain chemicals that would be circulating in your blood 
from getting into your brain. In other words, you have to protect that central nervous system because if something happens from toxicity, then you're hopeless. Well, microwaves damage the blood-brain barrier. Then chemical toxins that might be in your blood uh, or that you may have consumed, that you absorb, I'm thinking glyphosate from agrochemicals, uh, the Roundup, or, for example, the uh, chemicals in vaccines, the aluminum, the um, mercury preservatives in vaccines, or the, the things that uh, work on vaccines by, by inflammatory aggravation. Now these things get into the brain. They shouldn't be in the brain, and normally they wouldn't get in. But, you know, 10 minutes of holding a cell phone here will open up the blood-brain barrier, and then stuff gets into the brain that shouldn't get in. And the literature from a fellow in Sweden, Life Salford, shows that even when the exposure level is reduced a thousandfold, so let's put the cell phone over here and let's talk. Well, I'm sorry that that's a thousandfold less and you think you're not damaging your blood-brain barrier, but you can be. In other words, it takes very little radiation to open this membrane and to get things in your brain that don't belong there that can cause trouble. So I'm thinking that this could be implicated in things like autism, where uh, mercury, we know, is uh, Mad Hatter syndrome when it gets into the brain from history. And it's a neurotoxin. Aluminum is too. It's implicated in Alzheimer's. And doctors are already seeing a lot of neurological changes uh, in uh, the millennials, the generation born between 1980 and 2000. Uh, they have a lot of health problems. And they're the biggest cell phone users. And they grew up with this stuff. So even when we reduce the exposure, we're seeing this change. And so it's like a one-two punch. We have not only the Wi-Fi, but we have uh, agrochemicals and chemicals from the vaccines floating around in us that are now entering the brain. And a lot of new, um, I would say, syndromes and uh, disorders as a result of it. And yet this connection is not fully recognized. A few people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are bringing this out. And recently I heard him speak at the Heirloom Conference in California where he expressed concern about how the Wi-Fi might work in concert with the mercury, which is his main thing. He's finally seeing that you need to argue not just one problem, but you need to see the, the systemic nature of the pollution and how they work together. And hardly anybody's doing that. There are the people championing, well, we need to work on this chemical problem. Well, we also need to work on how the Wi-Fi and the chemicals are impacting life. It's not enough to just stand on one platform anymore in your own silo as an activist. You need to see the connections because they are the one-two punch or the one-two-three punch of what's happening to life on Earth. So, uh, so this is the guidelines. You know, there are no safety standards in the world. They actually jokingly call them standards. Uh, they can't even call them safety standards because that would be false. In the United States, they're called guidelines. They're federal guidelines of how much radiation we should get. Um, specific absorption rate, SAR, is what the government calls it. It's based solely on the thermal effect, the average value of the radiation, and not on the peak, peaks and troughs of the truly digital world of exposure. They don't consider any non-thermal effects. And it's interesting to note that the Russian guidelines for exposure are 100 times lower than the US. The Austrian guidelines are 1,000 times lower than the US. The China is more like the Russian uh, guidelines. And so our current guidelines will be upheld. The FCC recently did a six-year review. The FCC, mind you, I said, are no doctors, no scientists. They're businessmen and industrial representatives that work in the government. And they said that whatever we had for 4G, we're going to continue that guideline for 5G. But that's not really going to be true, because we know they're just going to add to what we already got with 4G. So in reality, we're going to have greater exposure. That's just how it's going to be. And I've already measured some schools. We had a dosimeter on some children, and they also took a meter to school. And we saw that they were over the federal guidelines. Why? Because they had cell phones. They had tablets, and they had industrial strength Wi-Fi in the room. And then they've got a room of about 20 students, all concentrated, operating these wireless tools. And the children, of course, are the future, and they're the most sensitive to the radiation because their brains are still developing and because they have very thin skulls. And this will 
probably cause havoc with brain development, as far as we know. So they're staying with current guidelines. They clearly offer insufficient protection. Another interesting thing is no insurance company will insure a cell phone provider or a cell phone company. They know these things cause health effects. There is no insurance. That's rather interesting. Um, what? It's very telling, yes. I mean, every product on the market has product liability insurance. You, you may have heard of that. If you make something, you need that to sell it, but not this stuff. But on the other hand, they've indemnified themselves with the laws that they have. With the 1996 Telecom Act, they're home free because health effects can't be discussed. So they can't be even brought into the courtroom. It's just like the vaccine companies that have indemnified themselves. If you have vaccine injury, you can't sue the company. They have laws. You can go to vaccine court. That's a federal court. Good luck. It'll take you 10 years to get there. There's a lineup. So that's how companies make laws to protect their, themselves and indemnify themselves from any litigations. It's very clever. So there's no safety standards for guidelines, uh, only guidelines. Now, if you want to hear the argument on this about what is safe, then I recommend you listen to videos by Dr. Barry Trower, T-R-O-W-E-R. -E Dr. Barry Trower was a microwaves weapons specialist in the UK. He's retired. He has a lot, of, uh, lot to say about this because it depends on who you are, your age, whether you're pregnant or not, how many years you've been exposed. The dosage is cumulative, just like x-rays or gamma rays. Yet who's wearing a dosimeter? We know in those fields, people wear a dosimeter to know the dose over time. When I worked with radioisotopes in a laboratory, I had to have a little badge that monitored me how much radioactive stuff I was exposed to. But nobody's wearing a dosimeter with respect to RF, radio frequencies. We have no idea what our dose is. I a dosimeter, there's one available from Germany. It costs $3,000. We got a hold of one, and we put it on children going to school in uh, Davis, California. And again, we saw that they got uh, a quite a high dose, um, again, from the classroom exposure and all the various devices. So it wasn't a good thing. And then we brought it up to the school, and they didn't want this going on, and they kind of silenced us because they're afraid of lawsuits. So that's what's happened. It, a lot of lip sealing over this issue. Uh, I think there's not a lot of people in this room, too, because people are in love with their wireless devices. They don't want to hear this. They don't want to take the red pill. It's too painful. And then they're going to have to change their behavior. That's what I found. So as I said to you, it's impossible to adapt to pulse digital signals. No life form can. And we have to consider how the phones are used and carried. If they're carried on the body in an on position, or are they on smart uh, uh, airplane mode? Uh, and we don't know the long-term exposure effects. All the experiments have involved short-term, where we have an animal or a cell culture in a laboratory for a finite amount of time, and we look before and after. What they're asking us uh, to do with 5G is, let's turn it on forever on the entire planet. And we have no data to support the safety of that. And nobody's even raising the question. Well, a few people are, but I mean, nobody in official places is listening. They're just brushing it aside, saying, it's safe because the industry says so, and the studies the industry has sponsored. Uh, well, but nobody's ever done the experiment to show the entire Earth uh, for all time is safe for life. So what kind of craziness is this? So you see, it's really a complex question. There is no consensus about what is safe. It's very hard to say if we turn on, flip the switch on 5G, forever on planet Earth, whether it's safe for all life. In fact, I think it's certainly not. And that's why I'm so um, motivated to get the word out about it. So here's, here's life in the real world. You know, you see the pregnant women balancing a computer or a tablet right near her unborn fetus, unaware. I've seen mothers juggle their cell phone, their smartphone, right next to the head of the baby that they're holding, or the baby in a, in a harness right near the head, totally unaware. Toddlers are given uh, pacifiers that are wireless. Even baby potty trainers that two-year-olds are getting have a screen built in with Wi-Fi, and they're going like this on the screen. They're multitasking already at two. They're learning to do it. You got to do two to three things at once in this world. You know, 
in order to make do by the time you're an adult. You better be multitasking at least three things. Uh, so that's what they're getting. And this is the world. And it's not safe. And nobody's noticing this. They make this stuff where they start in kindergarten now with screens instead of picture books. The, the Bluetooth is giving you about one-third of the radiation of a typical cell phone. But remember, it's blasting your brain. It's right here, and it's on all the time, again, in that pulsed mode. Polling, it's in the polling mode, where it's on, on every 10 times a second. It's not a good thing. So I'll say some words about the millennials and their health later. So we have this specific absorption rate. This is the official view. And in the United States, it's 1.6 watts per kilogram of our tissue. And it's all based on thermal effects, not anything more. We've totally ignored the non-thermal. Other parts of the world do not ignore them. The Russians have done a lot of research on this. And they know that there are non-thermal effects, and they accept it. So their limits are 100 times less than ours. And in some of the Eastern European countries, 1,000 times less. And when I've gone to Eastern Europe to talk about these things, I have a huge audience, and I get press all over the place, radio, newspaper, magazines interview me. In the United States, nobody wants to hear this. <laughs> Blissful ignorance. Blissful ignorance. Ignorance is bliss, right? Isn't that part of, yes. OK, and um, as I said, the insurance doesn't cover it. So we're based on these thermal effects that are obsolete. And that's, sorry, a duplicate slide. So OK, here are the non-thermal effects. And these are documented by thousands of papers, many of which are written in English, many of which were done in the United States and kind of thrown under the rug, uh, ignored. But uh, a range of biological effects from changes in gene expression, human performance, all the way to disease. DNA damage, breakage of DNA, mutations of DNA, and altered gene expression. Even in things like fruit flies done in the laboratory, clears as any other biological experiments. Reduce sperm count and fertility. Most of these were done offshore. Uh, sperm can't move either. The sperm movement is affected. I've seen that under the microscope, uh, very easily done. Take a sample of sperm, put a cell phone near it, then look under the microscope before and after, and oh my god, the sperm are like dead and can't move. So what do we expect from fertility? Well, it turns out animal fertility is greatly affected. Put a cage of rats not too far from a Wi-Fi modem, let's say a few feet away. What happens? Subsequent less and less offspring. Fourth generation is sterile. No more offspring. Irreversibly. That's something to be concerned about. I'm worried about the future of humanity when I see data like this. Also, fetal development and child development. Again, we see abnormalities in mice and other animals near these uh, Wi-Fi or cell phones done in studies. We see neurological changes, including brain degeneration, cognitive impairment. I would say learning disabled uh, people and even ADD and ADHD may be in part due to this. And we have epidemics of these things. Previously unknown in my generation, when we were young, there was no such thing. It's a new syndrome. Um, Oxidative stress and death of cells. I'll show you how that happens. Um, cardiovascular disease. First, it's an aggravation of the heart to have waves that are very different from heart waves. The heart is the most electrical organ of the body, not the brain. And some people are wearing cell phones in their shirt pocket or even in their pants pocket near the heart, which is electrical, sensitively so. And these energies, these waves are so different from the heart rhythm that it's an aggravation. And then it starts causing palpitations, slight irregularities. Then you get into heart arrhythmias. Then you need a pacemaker. But of course, the pharmaceutical industry is very happy with all this because they're making money. And nobody's making the connection that maybe if you turned off the Wi-Fi and got rid of it in the home, the heart arrhythmias would go away. That's the sort of thing we've seen. I myself. You buy a desktop computer, it comes with wireless mouse and wireless keyboard. I was sitting in front of that thing many hours, and then I started getting palpitations. And Harry suggested I get wired appliances, wired mouse and keyboard, and I did. And then the palpitations went away. So I saw it for myself. 
And yet, I was surprised at that. I didn't, I mean, I know all this stuff biologically. I didn't think I was getting that from my wireless mouse and keyboard. But they are also using these same frequencies. There's no need to have a wireless mouse and a wireless keyboard at your, your desktop station. You're not running around the house with the need for a wireless mouse. But yet, they come this way. Why? Because we have a fascination with wireless. That's the only thing I can figure. Uh, you're not running around with a keyboard or a mouse, so why does it need to be wireless? It doesn't need to be. And by the way, then you need to stick a battery in there all the time when the wireless dies in your mouse. When it's wired, you never need to stick a battery in. It's always working. So it's kind of stupid, really, to have a wireless mouse. Uh, we should get rid of them. So met metabolic and immune system disruption. Yes, there's an increase in that going on as well. And eye and skin damage is implicated in cataracts. And uh, we're seeing an epidemic of cataracts at, even in younger people. And the World Health Organization categorizes Wi-Fi as a class 2B human carcinogen. And they're probably going to move it up to a 2A, which is even worse, uh, and, and causing brain cancers, gliomas. A glioma is probably one of the most deadly brain cancers. I've known several people who've died of it. And one of them that I knew had a Wi-Fi modem right near their computer screen. So basically, it was two feet from their head for some time. And then they ended up with brain cancer. And usually, it's fatal. It's very difficult to treat. Acoustic neuromas, I've already mentioned, these things in the inner ear that were unheard of before we started doing this with cell phones. So if you want to know where I get my documentation, there are thousands of studies. There are unclassified US military studies. Here's a website, uh, the so-called Bioinitiative Report, bioinitiative.org, with 1,800 references to the peer-reviewed scientific literature. In Europe, there's uh, also um, a very large one. And you can access it uh, through our own US National Institutes of Health, PubMed websites. And then there's an even older source called the Glazer Report. Uh, the Naval Medical Research Institute uh, looked at the influence of radar waves on military men and women and found biological effects and then uh, reported on this. And, and many of these waves were analog back then. They weren't yet digital. Digital waves cause worse problems because of the pulsing nature. So just the pure sine waves or, or modulated waves of, um, of radio frequencies do damage. But now the pulsation adds yet another level of problems. So there are really a lot of studies. And I'll tell you some of the specific ones on the environment a little bit. That'll be later today. So the epidemiology of all of this, the chronic exposure to these waves is linked to cancer. And the World Health Organization admits in glioma, brain cancer, and acoustic neuroma is on the rise and increased risk. We have the multiple sources of exposure. And we have the idea that um, also um, that it's cumulative. What we see increasing is electrohypersensitivity or electrosensitivity syndrome. Doctors don't even know this, most of them. I've tried to give this seminar to, or in a, in a concentrated form, to medical personnel. But it has not yet been approved by the accreditors who give continuing medical education credits. Can you imagine? They need to hear this. But I, I tried to get into several uh, holistic organizations. And I've spoken in those same organizations on other topics, like energy medicine over the years. So they know me. But when I try to get this into the curriculum, it's been refused in most cases. So. Well, I don't know where, where that comes from. It's hard to say, because the accreditation of continuing medical education, uh, that's what MDs need to do and what nurses need to do. I don't understand it, but it could be a link with pharmaceutical industry as well as telecom putting the lid on you know, and somehow infiltrating those accreditation agencies. But health for, healthcare providers need continuing education in order to keep their licenses in most states. And every state has different rules on this. And I know they pay a lot for these courses. And this message needs to get to them so they connect the dots and realize these headaches and these, you'll see in the next slide coming up, um, 
let's see. I don't want to go too far ahead. I'm coming up to electrosensitivity and what the, what the signs of it are. But if you read the manual on your cell phone, and how many of you are aware that there's a manual on your cell phone? Uh, you know, the city of Berkeley, California, created a law that if you buy a cell phone in Berkeley, you need a physical manual. And then the city was sued by the industry. Oh, yes. They had to go to court, and they won. And then they won an appeals court. So they are, they, the industry has to create a manual, a physical manual to hand you if you buy your cell phone in Berkeley. It's probably the only city in the country that I know. The rest of us, I've tried to find the manual on my phone. I couldn't find it. It should be somewhere embedded in you know, the guts of your cell phone. I could never find it. But if you could find it, it says to keep your phone at least 0.98 inches from your body, about an inch from your body, to avoid a lot of radiation. Because the more you have it closer to your body, it really is blasting you. So one inch away is already, it goes down like one over R squared. So it drops pretty drastically. And um, few people know this. So holding it out an inch or two inches is really better, unless you have your, your headphones on. And then you can keep it uh, three feet or so with the wires going to your ears. So the FCC recently reviewed their guidelines for RF, and they're, they're sticking to it. This is Chairman Pai, who, Pei, or Pai, who is head of the FCC and the, the team of six people that oversees his entire operation for the United States with no doctors, no scientists. So they reviewed everything for six years, and they're keeping to the same guidelines for 5G. So that's what's coming up there. Um, OK, so what happened to my electrosensitivity? Somewhere I have the, the thing. But here's how it acts as electrosmog. And we know the word electrosmog. Um, electrosmog can cause functional illness, and it's been known for a long time. It disrupts the redox reactions in your body. Besides disrupting the oscillators like brain waves or heart waves, there's deep down um, a lot of Virtually all the biochemical reactions work on electrons getting added or subtracted from, from molecules. And it shifts this whole balance of the redox, the reduction oxidation reactions toward oxidation uh, and reactive oxygen species, which is also produced when you're stressed, including the formation of hydrogen peroxide and free radicals such as superoxide ions. Now, what these free radicals do is they go around then all your biomolecules and they attack them. So proteins will be disrupted, DNA will be disrupted, especially unsaturated fatty acids on your membranes will be disrupted. And then you get cumulative damage to all of those things as you continue your exposure. You have a system to try to clean it up, but as you age, then that gets worse. And so, so all your vital biomolecules are going to be attacked by free radical production as a result of this. And then, resultingly, you have functional disruptions at all levels, energy metabolism, immune response, heredity, and the plethora of functional diseases. That's how it happens. So there's no one disease that you can say, this causes only this. It's a lot of things. And consequently, that's very hard to point the finger to. And on top of it, I would say the stress, and I probably have that slide coming up, the stress in the body is cumulative. Um, you can have psychological stress. You can have physical stress. And the stressors accumulate, and then you have breakdown when you have so much stress that you can't adapt anymore. So here are some functional diseases and disorders related to oxidative stress that are related to exposure to radio frequencies. So, and we see these in increasing in our society, sleep disorders, insomnia, waking up in the middle of the night, unable to get to sleep, not restful sleep, fatigue, uh, no relaxation and recuperation times, ineffective, restlessness and even panic disorder, chronic hypoglycemia and even hyperglycemia, increased triglyceride, increased cholesterol, lactate acidosis, fibromyalgia, autoimmunity, uh, hardening of the arteries, and various neurological diseases, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, alateral uh, sclerosis, Alzheimer's, lactose intolerance, chronic immune insufficiency, thyroid disorders, enteropathy, um, and cancer. So it's uh, chronic disease across the board is uh, a result. 
I would say, of many onslaughts to life, of, of which wireless is one. So it goes down to this uh, oxidative damage, and low-level radio frequencies do this. And as I said earlier, there are thousands of research papers that show this evidence. And uh, then it's going to create cell damage. And unless your cells can repair themselves quickly and have time off from the radiation, and are we going to have time off with 5G? No, because it's going to be there all the time, everywhere, with the satellites. So we're not going to have the recuperation time that we even have now from 4G, where we can maybe flip the switch on our Wi-Fi and go to bed and recover. So um, here's another way in which it may act that Dr. Martin Paul has suggested that it opens the voltage-gated calcium channels on cell membranes, allowing calcium to enter the cells. And calcium is a very important second messenger and can change the course of biochemical pathways in the body. So uh, he's got a lot of publications and a free ebook. If you Google dark, Dr. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, you'll get his materials. It's very, very good, but very technical. So here's a, a little bit about electrosensitivity. So back in 2011, the World Health Organization said it's up to 6% of the world population already. And they're having symptoms. You don't have to have all of these symptoms to be considered electrosensitive. So my issue with heart palpitations from my wireless mouse and wireless keyboard is an example of electrosensitivity. Other people experience headaches, anxiety, irritability, sleep problems, restlessness, brain fog, difficulty concentrating, memory issues, ring in the ears, or tinnitus is a major one. Many people have this. Heart palpitations, heart arrhythmias, depression, fatigue, and there are others. This is the sign of our times. When I gave this lecture to some of my doctoral students at Saybrook University, uh, many of the students then went home and implemented my ideas to reduce their exposure to their wireless devices. And lo and behold, they all came back to me and they said, we felt better. We didn't believe it. We felt better. Thank you for pointing out what was wrong with us. Because most people were just going and getting medicated. That's what doctors do. They write prescriptions for these things and they deal with the symptoms instead of going to the root cause. So, okay, so we're continuing now. Um, this was a very amazing report done by Blue Cross Blue Shield, HMOs, on the millennials. Millennials born between 1980 and 2000. So this is the generation that grew up with Wi-Fi, but also um, that's not the only onslaught to their lives. And I'm not blaming them, uh, recognizing that every generation gets kind of embroiled with the technology of the times. Um, but they use, they use wireless maybe more than most other generations. So this report was on hundreds of thousands of millennials. And that's a big sample across the United States. They showed a sharp decline in their health starting at age 27. This is the most unhealthy generation to date in the history of the United States. Not that we've followed them all the way back, but still, it's amazing to see this because they have chronic disease. They have health issues, both mental and physical, heart, uh, immune system disorders, neurological disorders, and they're young. Psychiatric and disorders. Psychiatric disorders, and they're on a lot of drugs already. So just in three years, 2014 to 2017, Depression went up 31%, hyperactivity 29%, type 2 diabetes went up 22%, and hypertension 16%. It looks like an old population, but they're young. This is serious. And ages 34 to 36 had 21% more cardiovascular conditions and 15% more endocrine conditions in 2017 than in 2014. Now, the Blue Cross Blue Shield report does not conclude that wireless may be a factor, but I think seriously we need to consider that as one causal factor. And then there are more. There's agrochemical exposure, and we know from the JAMA article that, uh, that glyphosate is in our urine, the urine of adults. It was published in JAMA, the most prestigious medical journal in the United States. So we have uh, that problem. We have a lot of vaccinations of this generation, and now we have wireless. So this is a serious um, report that points to health consequences of Wi-Fi uh, continuous use. Now I want to show you a study I did on 4G. 
uh, several years ago. And my research question was, is the blood affected by short-term exposure to a smartphone? I, this was a small pilot study. And it was funded by the Weston A. Price Foundation, which is um, a holistic group out of Washington, DC, that's quite interested in the diet that Weston A. Price, the, uh, the dentist of 1950s, recommended that you would agree is probably a good diet. It's pastured meats, raw milk, raw cheeses, organic food, uh, the right oils, not industrial oils. Uh, and their question was, you know, can we see protection from that diet? That was part of the research study as well. So I used 10 healthy adults because, again, it's a small study just to look for an effect. A single smartphone was used. And I looked at the blood under the dark field microscope at baseline. After wearing the phone 45 minutes in a backpack, the phone was turned on but not in use. In other words, it was in readiness position. And then 45 minutes of active use uh, touching the phone, going to the internet, and two five-minute phone calls to the head, kind of mimicking typical use. And then another blood test. So three blood tests compared, and the blood was photographed under the microscope. So here's my system, my microscope with camera, and we can watch the blood on a screen. Um, finger prick, in some cases, uh, not only finger blood was used, but toe blood, because some people would say, well, but you're holding the phone in the hand, so maybe the hand blood is affected. But the blood is circulating, and we found the same results from toe blood. So here's normal, healthy blood. Under dark field, you see the rounded red blood cells. And in the middle, there is one white blood cell in the act of swimming toward 2 o'clock. And this blood is very healthy um, and normal. But you know, I see less and less of this over the years. Here's what happens when a 75-year-old woman, whose blood initially in the upper left-hand corner is then carrying the phone. Uh, 45 minutes later, her blood is as seen in the right here, <clears throat> where the cells are stuck together in what we call rouleau or rolls, like a roll of coins seen on end, a roll of nickels or something. So when you have blood stuck together like that, microcirculation is impaired. And um, the, all of the organs then can't get good circulation to the tiniest microcapillaries that require blood cells to scrunch down and pass single file, because the diameter of the blood vessels is actually tinier than the red blood cells. And the third picture is what happens after you carry, excuse me, use a cell phone for 45 minutes after this carrying condition. Then the cells look like bottle caps. They're distorted, and there are spikes uh, sticking out. And those are called echinocytes in hematology after the concept of the sea urchin, uh, an echinoderm. So this is what happens to people over 50 years old carrying the cell phones and using them. I didn't see such a pronounced effect in the younger people. Maybe they have more, resilient, more resilience or resistance to the stressor. Here's a 55-year-old male. Initially, the blood looks pretty good. After carrying the phone, uh, stuck together cells, and after using the phone, virtually 100% echinocytes. And I don't know if this is reversible. I mean, maybe it is, but I didn't study that, because these people were already in my laboratory for five, six hours to do these experiments and in a fasted condition, so I had to let them go. Just to, in brief, and you can read the study at brubick.com under publications. It's available. Nine out of 10 subjects showed unhealthy blood changes following cell phone exposure. The, uh, most of the younger people did not show such extreme changes, but there still were changes. And the way it happened was we first saw aggregation of the cells, and then further exposure, the aggregates broke down, and the cells changed shape. This was published in the Journal of the Weston A. Price Association, uh, Weston A. Price Foundation Association, Wise Traditions in Food Farming and the Healing Arts. And you can find it free online at westonaprice.org. So I actually presented that lecture um, at one of the industrial meetings um, on cell phones. And uh, I wondered what the reaction to it was. And they said, it isn't really important because I didn't show any disease. I simply showed uh, an effect on blood, but it wasn't associated with a new disease. In other words, they were going by the old medical model that you need a diagnosis, and then that's a health problem. Uh, that looking more deeply at functional changes is not important to them. 
So we are energy beings, as I said, and we are sensitive to energy. I actually have worked on this for some 40 years, looking at energy healing, looking at influences of the, in the human biofield and measuring aspects of the human biofield and its relationship to natural emitters like the sun and one another in the form of energy healers and now from our technologies. And it's clear to me that unnatural frequencies are aggravating us biologically, morphologically, as well as functionally. So our energy fields are impacted by unnatural frequencies from wireless. And I'll say a few words about the biofield. I could give you hours of lectures on this topic because this is my, my, my foundational work, um, the energy field of humans. I consider the energy field of life, that each organism has an energy field, that it's a dynamic and complex field, probably the most complicated field that we know of in the universe. And it's intimately involved in life's functions. It's not just passive. The way um, conventional medicine thinks about the fields from the brain and heart, they don't think of them as active. They just think of them as passive. And matter of fact, that the brain makes brain waves as part of its um, output, but it's like uh, noise. You know, The main function is the chemistry in the brain. I would argue that the field of life is intimately involved in its regulation and biocommunication, and we need to look at these fields um, more deeply and not just as junk. So the, the human biofield consists of energy fields within and around the body, and it's not only electromagnetic, it's also electric, magnetic, acoustical, there are sound because of the thump thump of the heart, and possibly more subtle energies. And my laboratory is involved in elucidating the various bands of the biofield. The biofield carries bioinformation, it's involved in biocommunication and bioregulation. And I've written papers on this, here's a couple. Uh, in the Journal of Complementary, Alternative and Complementary Medicine, published in 2002, and then more recently in the journal Cosmos and History, published in 2015. Uh, and there are others who have published as well. And here's an example of how we measure the biofield. Uh, I would actually don't show you the device here, but it's a camera from Russia called the Gas Discharge Visualization Camera, and another one called the BioWell, Bio-Well. And initially, this biofield looks quite good. This is a woman who came to me because she had trouble with electrosensitivity. And I said, well, bring your computer, because I don't have any wireless devices here. Um, so we'll see how you do with it. And I said, but don't use it for four hours before you come. OK, so she brought her notebook computer. And I measured her initially. Her biofield looked very good. This is a composite biofield made from the individual finger corona discharges exposed to high voltage electrophotography. And then I had her work one hour at her own computer in my lab. And then I measured her biofield again. And it doesn't take much to, you know, without quantitative analysis, you can see clearly that this field is quite distorted and shrunk. And so what happened here? This is the picture of electrosensitivity. That's how it looks. But even people who aren't electrosensitive they, they say they don't have any symptoms. They come in, and I say, don't touch your wireless devices for a few hours. Bring it. And here you are. They look OK. And then touch and play with your cell phone for 30 minutes. And what happens? The biofield changes. And what we see is a rather fractalated biofield. That's the picture of chronic stress and, and the analysis to see such energy diminution, and um, it, it's aggravated, really, by the stressor, even though this person claims, I don't have any symptoms. But the biofield is impacted. And if we continue impacting the biofield negatively, then we may be on the road to chronic breakdown. So chronic stress is part of the problem here. We not only have Wi-Fi stress, we have, we have chemical stress, as we've been just talking about. We have psychological stress in our culture. We have many stressors. And it's all cumulative in terms of how we react to the stress. So what does chronic stress do to us? It reduces our mental and physical performance. It causes anxiety and depression. It reduces our sex drive. Lowers our resistance to diseases. And doctors say, and they know this, they've learned, 80% of all our chronic health problems are stress-related. 
And at a biochemical level, we see greater inflammation. And inflammation is at the root of chronic disease, cancer, heart disease, autoimmune disease, among others. This is a concept from um, biofeedback and stress science. We can say liken stress to collecting raindrops in a rain barrel. And stress can accumulate like those raindrops, but the barrel can only hold so much water. And at some point, then it overflows or breaks down. The system breaks down. And that's how our bodies react to stress. And we're going through the point of being overwhelmed by the stress in our lives. So what are the effects of radio frequency, microwaves, and millimeter waves on the environment? This is a whole chapter in itself here. And I made a thorough search of uh, online uh, of the papers, and I'm going to present to you some of that evidence. I already mentioned this, that organisms can sense extremely small fields, not just humans, but other organisms. There's a lot of Russian research on this, looking at the influences of very subtle fields on, on organisms in the laboratory uh, and in the field, but much more laboratory research than field research. But one of the papers, um, and you can download this paper online, this paper is at www.5gspaceappeal.org. There's the appeal that they wrote is a PDF with, with numerous references. And references number 32 to 48 document changes in the environment, based um, sometimes on laboratory studies, but also on some environmental markers as well. And they have evidence of harm to diverse plant and wildlife and laboratory animals, including ants. And they, the scientists studying ants say ants are a literal biomarker for Wi-Fi. You turn on Wi-Fi, ants leave. Animals sense these things. They leave. Birds leave. Bees leave. If we put them in national parks, which people are considering, because again, they want to make every square inch of the planet uh, wi fi up with 5G, what's going to happen to those animals? Where the hell are they going to go? Yes, but it's really hard to and it may be linked with the agrochemicals, and it's hard to dissect. And maybe we shouldn't dissect, because we have this whole system approach here where we're not going to say how much is this insecticide or this uh, agrochemical versus Wi-Fi. Nobody's done that dissection analysis. So I don't know that we can, because the environment's so chemically polluted and now becoming Wi-Fi polluted. So ants, birds, forests, frogs, fruit flies, honeybees, inse other insects, mammals, mice, plants, rats, and trees have been studied. I'm going to give you some of the highlights of these studies. Also, microbiological effects have been recorded. And even though I did not find any studies on soil microbes, if you start fooling around with the microbes of Earth, remember that it's a pyramid. The life on Earth is, think of the pyramid, at the bottom of the foundation are the microbes. And this group knows them more than most. Not only soil microbes, but the microbiome within us. We are 10 times more microbes than human cells. Every organism depends on microbes. The microbes do all the ecological cycles on Earth. And if we disrupt that, we have totally blown it on this planet. So. Uh, that's one of the consequences of this, as you'll see. Now, there was um, Wi-Fi, I guess, put in Australia in the national park. So we should learn from them. There's a national park there called Nightcap National Park. I believe it's in New South Wales. I haven't been there. But they had a decade of wireless technology, and they have found the exodus of species, of natural species in their national park. Now, so far, our national parks are Wi-Fi free. As far as I know, in the National Monuments, when you go there, your cell phone doesn't operate. That's a good thing. We want to keep it that way, at least some white zones on this planet. But unfortunately, the satellite plans will not keep those white zones. The scarcity of birds near 4G cell phone towers. Bird watchers notice this. In places where there are towers, those birds are gone. The animals have simply left. They know better. They can sense it, and they move on. They know better than humanity that these things are not healthy. Another study looking at trees near a cell phone base station. In the direct line with the way the waves would be coming from those stations, the trees are damaged. They're crooked in the way they've grown. They seem to grow away from the way the waves are propagating. Uh, and um, there are some other effects that I'll describe 
later. Bees have altered behavior, and the stress biochemistry in the bees has been studied and known, and that's a bad thing. Any gardener, if you look at bee behavior, the bees are abnormal. They, they're not moving well. I see bees missing flowers. How is that possible? They're, they're mistaking a colored leaf for a flower. Their sense of smell is affected. Their sense of detecting the nectar is detected. And they've directly studied bees with cell phones near plants and, and hives and have noticed their, their behavior is bizarre. In, uh, I've already mentioned the study, but people have put cages of mice near uh, Wi-Fi routers. So the 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz affect less and less newborns. Mice usually have big litters, and then they get tinier litters. And then by the fourth generation, no more reproduction. Nothing. Irreversible sterility. Oh my god. If this happens at the animal level, what's going to happen at the human level? Maybe it already is. Well, again, when in my generation, there were no fertility clinics. I can't remember a single thing. You probably don't remember it. Now we have fertility clinics. People have trouble getting pregnant. The young women. And I'm not surprised because sperm counts, sperm motility would be affected. And young men that I know keep the cell phone right near their testicles where sperm production is made. And, and then you tell them about this, some of them, and their attitude is, well, you know, if I don't carry my cell phone, I can't communicate with my girlfriend. And there goes my girlfriend, gone. So it's, it's an attitude, you know, but they need to change their, the way they're using these devices, is what I say. They're ignorant and they think it's safe because it's sold and it must be okay. And this is faulty thinking. So um, where am I on this list? OK. Uh, this was a curious thing. So um, stem cells in the bone marrow seem to proliferate uh, greatly when exposed to radio frequencies. That means you make a lot more blood cells. Animals are making red cells like mad, white cells like mad, platelets like mad, but they're abnormal looking. The blood cells have, are tiny. They're not the normal size. So we don't even know the long-term consequences of things like this. We have such strange effects that no one's ever seen in biology. Who knows what that means when you have tiny little cells and made all the time. And you know, stressing the bone marrow to make more and more and more blood um, it could lead to a cancer of the bone marrow, I can imagine. So uh, that was done in um, the Journal of Environment and Occupational Science in 2012. Radio frequencies uh, all the way up to one gigahertz have strong adverse effect on growth rate and the fall anthocyanin production in aspen trees. This was a field study in Colorado and the aspen, beautiful aspen there. And aspen is declining also in that region and it's probably no wonder. And that's out in the wilderness, folks. What's gonna happen when we have satellites blasting these trees? Now, insects communicate electromagnetically. If you, if you want to read some great papers and books on this, I recommend Phil Callahan's work. And I knew him, and he was a great entomologist and systems thinker, now deceased, but wonderful guy, um, who wrote this book, among others, Tuning into Nature. So he looked at even insect parts, like the wings and the legs and the bumps on the legs. If you magnify an insect under the microscope, you see they look kind of strange, all these bumps on their bodies. Those are antennas. They're antennas and they communicate with radiation. They signal this to one another and they stay in swarms. And uh, moths get attracted to the opposite sex by these things. So those bumps on insects are like millimeter wave uh, producers and antennas that receive radiation. And he wrote books on this and wonderful papers. And his work was highly disregarded, but really could be a whole new way to control insects instead of using agrochemicals. Of course, if we kept plants healthy, then they don't get sick with insects anyway. But that's another level of agriculture. But um, so the insect uh, bumps, et cetera, are like waveguides. Um, and uh, they have dielectric thermoelectric properties. So he's got technical papers on this as well as great books. And um, so if we start blasting insects with millimeter waves, which is of the order of their size, the bumps, et cetera, are like millimeters or less, 
then we're about to impact their whole communication system and they're not going to behave normally. And that's exactly what we see. You know, colony collapse among bees and insects just don't know. The good pollinators are, are mainly affected. So there are technical papers on this since the 60s and more recent work as well, but not as many as uh, the agrochemical papers. So the beneficial insects, and I would add the birds and the mammals, orientation and navigation are most affected. So or the way animals orient and navigate are, they clearly use natural fields, and if those natural fields are dwarfed by artificial fields, but what I mean by natural fields are Schumann resonance, the natural earth fields of 7.8 hertz, that's a very low level signal compared to the Wi-Fi stronger and stronger. So that's what they see or feel and then they don't have that navigation clear. So migratory behavior might be affected. I haven't seen papers on that, but clearly disorientation and damage to bees and pollinators has been shown. And learning in bees, and learning behavior is also diminished and we can expect the collapse. So any gardener, just go out and watch the bees and you'll see that they look, they look half dead and they, they don't behave right. They normally would zoom, they'd beam right into a flower and do their job and go on to the next. They're not doing that anymore. They're, they're rolling around and acting really strange. Birds, um, particularly birds like um, geese that migrate, they depend on natural electromagnetic signals and signaling one another as well. That coordinates their behavior and navigation. And they're totally confused and confounded. There was a video on YouTube, and I don't know how uh, sound some of this is. As a scientist, I have to be aware of looking at YouTube videos. But this one was from Holland, and it was said uh, that they turned on 5G near a park, and then a bunch of tiny birds hit the ground and died. And they were picking up hundreds of birds that were dead near a new installation of an antenna. So it may be the navigation was so impacted that they hit the ground or they may have gotten sick. But it was very sudden and they were just like in shock and the birds were dead. So again, that's anecdotal. That's just YouTube videos. That's not scientific and I am a scientist, but it's out there. People have noticed strange things like this. And um, we don't know if natural migration is affected. We'd have to uh, call upon... Um, the experts, and I haven't seen any publications on that, but I can imagine that it's so. Um, effects on plants, uh, these are some experiments. Um, 900 megahertz, just two hours exposure, a plant called duckweed. This grows in, uh, I guess, uh, aquatic areas. They showed reactive oxygen species and peroxidase activity increase. So this is the same thing that happens in us. The free radical chemistry increases also in plants. And I would suggest it's true across the board, probably all life forms are experiencing it as a stressor, electromagnetic stressor. And with that, they turn on the stress chemistry, the free radical chemistry. And by the way, this would uh, also cause um, advanced aging. Reactive oxygen species are always increased in aging people and uh, the elderly. So then you're just accelerating aging of all species, of all uh, of all entities, living entities on Earth. Onions, uh, 2100 megahertz, that's 2.1 gigahertz. Exposed just one to four hours, again, the same. Increase in reactive oxygen species, lipid peroxidation, and superoxide dismutase, an enzyme that tries to detoxify uh, some of these things. And these are some recent studies, Chandel et al., 2017. In some tomato plant studies, and I don't have the reference on this, they used the whole radio frequency spectrum and they found also stress-related biochemicals in tomato plants. Now, we're eating these plants. So are we eating stress chemistry in our produce? Yes, we are. What's that doing to us? Well, it's adding to our free radical dose, it seems to me, uh, produced in ourselves. Now it's in our foods, even in vegetables. So something to think about. So overall, the effects on plants, metabolic changes, gene expression modifications, and altered plant development in laboratory studies and field observations. You can try this experiment yourself. If you have a Wi-Fi router, and I don't recommend one, but they're common, put a house plant near there, right next to it, and watch how crooked it grows. You can see for yourself. It's impacted. 
trees. Uh, the single field study on trees that I found was in Germany by Waldman Selsum uh, in Bamberg, Germany. And they noticed, uh, looking very carefully on trees in the vicinity of phone masts, which are actually cell phone towers, abnormal development, particularly in the uh, facing the tower, uh, brown leaves already starting in early summer. Um, Oh, that's a mistake. It should be decreased, oh no, increased crown transparency. That means it's thinning out in the crown of the tree, falling leaves and less growth. And um, most damage was nearest the phone, cell phone towers, and unilaterally in the direction of the radiation field. So it seemed clearly related to the radiation coming right out of these chambers, uh, these devices. Here's an effect on microbes. So listeria is a known pathogen. Uh, e there are pathogenic strains of E. coli. There's a lot of beneficial ones. But they took pathogenic strains, and they found in decreased antibiotic resistance. In other words, the growth of these pathogens went bigger as a result of exposure to 900, megabird, 900 megahertz from cell phones, 4G, or 2.4 gigahertz, 4G Wi-Fi. So this is something to really be concerned about, because as I said earlier, micro, microbes are the foundation of life on Earth. And we have 10 times more microbial cells in our body than human cells. We are colonies of microbes walking around. We depend on a sensitive ecological balance. And there are pathogens, and we don't want them growing when beneficial bacteria may be impacted negatively. This is some recent research, 2017, in the journal Dose Response. Now, here's um, a quote from Rudolf Steiner. Uh, you may know who he is. Uh, he lived 100 years ago or more. And he wrote these very prophetic words about electricity. Electricity is really not something that can work on living things and do any good. You see, electricity lies one level below the living and the higher a given form of life is, the more it tries to ward off electricity. If you constantly make an organism defend itself unnecessarily, it gradually gets nervous and fidgety and sclerotic. Amazing prophetic words of a great master of holistic systems over 100 years ago. He watched the introduction of electricity in his life. And this is what he saw. There are books that document. There's a book called Electricity in Life. If you want to read that, I highly recommend it, about the onset of electricity over 100 years ago and how life has changed since that. Of course, we were born into it, but how health has deteriorated since the onset of just electricity on Earth is profound. And we're just talking about one aspect here, but that's something more to think about and how prophetic his words are. So here's the global environmental change that we might expect from 5G kind of summarized. We're going to see biofields of all living things impacted by these pulsed, digitized, unnatural frequencies. If this goes through as planned, it's really an unprecedented experiment at a global level with involuntary exposure of all life forms. And yet there's no discussion about this. And now we see the cutting down of the severe trimming of trees. One thing that I fail to mention is that millimeter waves, the big basic component of 5G, is somewhat blocked by foliage. So right now they're cutting and trimming a lot of trees. In California, they may be trimming trees because of fires, purportedly wildfires. I think they're trimming trees because of 5G. They want it to reach us more. So they're cutting the crowns of trees, sometimes just flat off, leaving a stump. I've seen this in my own neighborhood. It's shocking, really ugly. And of course, that will change um, how carbon dioxide gets processed. Uh, the environmentalists should be squawking about it, but I don't know. So if 5G goes as planned, no living thing will be able to avoid exposure, but it's going to be ongoing and continuous 24-7, 365, to levels of radio frequency radiation that are hundreds of times greater than even what exists today without any possibility of escape because the entire planet will be blanketed. So we can expect serious irreversible effects on humans and damage to all of Earth's ecosystems. Does going underground shield us from any of this? Yes. 
Underground, you would be shielded. That's right. But, you know, it's, uh, who wants to live there? You need the sun, I mean, and plants need light, etc. So, now, I'm not the only scientist talking like this. I'm, there's a growing number, and health and environmental concerns regarding 5G deployment and even 4G the way it is. Uh, there's websites, the 5gappeal.eu, uh, kind of an international one that started in Europe. There's also a moratorium on 5G in various parts of the world. And Brussels, this Mayor Brussels flatly said, we're not taking 5G here. It, its health has not been proven safe. So they're putting the brunt on the industry to show it's safe. Well, of course, they're not going to show it's safe, except by hijacking the science. Parts of Switzerland, certain cantons have said no to 5G, parts of Rome and Germany. I just returned from um, giving a presentation in Italy to the Italian government on 5G, who is making it part of the platform for the election. So we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, the way the laws stand in our country, we'd have to undo federal laws. Uh, and some people are suing the federal government. The Santa Fe Alliance is suing them, and these lawsuits are long and drawn out. And by the way, when you sue the federal government, you don't gain anything financially. It's not like a civil lawsuit where the, the case wins money. So how do lawyers get paid to do this? They do it pro bono or somebody raises money through a nonprofit to pay them. So th that's problematic uh, because you only may get a result, but you're not going to get any money suing the federal government. There's a lot of cities that have sued over jurisdiction issues and the fast track that they don't have time to review, et cetera. And uh, I don't know where those cases go. I'm sure they're long and drawn out. The Native Americans have won a major settlement. And maybe, uh, I don't know how they're going to relate to the satellites, but uh, a federal court recently ruled in August. And they consolidated and made this lawsuit jointly under one tribe, but it represented all Native American tribes across the United States, that 5G equipment, the antennas, cannot be installed without environmental and historic reviews. And they cited two laws on the books. Again, the National Environment Policy Act of 1969, and another law that I didn't know about, the National Historic Preservation Act, which preserves their sacred lands. And based on this, they, they can't get the antennas so far. The Supreme Court didn't. They could always bring it up in the Supreme Court, but it was a district appeals court that they won the case. So the industry may take it higher, we'll see. And you can read about this on this website. And that was a major breakthrough. I wish we had more things like that to talk about. Uh, there's definitely lawsuits about um, the FCC's accounting policies are also corrupt. Uh, people have looked into that. And they've also said that the FCC can't order us uh, around that they don't have jurisdiction over local governments. So people are raising issues about this. They said they're arbitrary and capricious. There are current cases in the federal DC Court of Appeals. And you can read about these as scientists for wiredtech.com. And there's many, many cities uh, in my area, Mill Valley, California, San Jose, which is in Silicon Valley, sued the federal government over uh, jurisdiction and uh, fast rollout issues uh, that they can't manage. So these things are going on, and it's hard to say what will come of them and whether 5G, which is scheduled to be rolled out in 2020, is going to go on or whether it will be stopped. We're at a very pivotal point, clearly. So many local communities around are taking action. And I can tell you what's going on in the San Francisco Bay Area. So city councils are, some of them, the people have put pressure on them to create a wireless emergency wireless telecom ordinances. The city usually has an ordinance about placement of these devices, the, the, um, the antennas. And many of them say, we don't want the stuff in residential areas or near schools. They say that now. And others don't say anything. So you have to look online at your city wireless ordinance to see what is the situation for you. Because they're all different. And it may be overrode by the federal government, and maybe not. We're waiting to hear what is the uh, result of these lawsuits. But um, some of the cities are making emergency wireless ordinances that say, now we don't want these things in our residential areas. We don't want them near schools. Whether they will be considered legitimate is another story because of the federal laws on the books. And some ordinances are demanding, we want fiber optics up to our home. 
that would be a good choice. Even if we had to pay for it, it's expensive. But we have landlines that are copper, and they're going to let go of supporting those landlines. Soon, copper lines are going to be like uh, obsolete. As old versions of Windows go obsolete, copper lines won't be supported anymore by your telecom industry, and landlines will just go dead. And that's crazy, because we see in times of power shut off and everything, your cell phones don't work. You know, uh, you don't have enough juice to uh, keep them going in five days of a power outage. And then you can't get gasoline because the pumps are down because the grid's down. So you can't even fuel your car where you might be able to charge your cell phone with one of those adapters. So we saw in California how that goes when your landlines, if you don't have a landline, you're screwed in terms of communicating with your loved ones and knowing what's going on. So we don't really want to just operate on cell phones, but that's what's, that's the, what's coming. And uh, anyway, um, so you can work through your local city councils and your city planning commissions to try to build appropriate legislation at your local levels. I don't know how that's going to stand in court, but I highly recommend that you take this action. Now, the Greens have an interesting view on 5G. I've looked toward the Greens thinking, well, they might be on our side, but yes and no. You know, the Greens think the wireless is um, going to reduce energy consumption. The Greens, like the Green Party. But the Green Party is not a unified body. And I've read some Greens that uh, say the carbon footprint of this endeavor is enormous, and we, there's no review of the whole thing in terms of the hardware, software, and blasting of these frequencies, the launching of satellites. So we shouldn't move ahead with it until we've reviewed it all. Some other Greens say, hey, this is energy efficient. Let's go. You know, you look at major green names and see what their writings say, and then you're going to see a mixed bag. You don't see a unified vision. That's too bad, because I thought I'd have support with the greens. So what you see is, again, splinters. And that's exactly what keeps us divided. It keeps us from coming together collectively to make action. Making nourishing action on Earth is the division that we have. Unfortunately, due to the silos of thinking, the reductionism. So um, 5G is going to re really require a lot of material, a lot of uh, energy to implement it. We're going to have to get all new phones. We have to toss out our old phones and the waste there. So the carbon footprint is really enormous, if you think about it all. Now, there's some green members who want a moratorium on 5G, and they want independent health and environmental impact review. And I've read papers by them. And I applaud them. That's good. Uh, but I don't think we're going to have that review before the rollout in this country. It may happen in other countries. But that's why this is a very pivotal time, because 2020 is the scheduled rollout. And we've got to move forward collectively very, very fast to get people um, educated about this. And I'm kind of sad to see so few people here, because uh, you know, getting the word out on this is absolutely pivotal. Here's another thing that you can do. Um, the international appeal to stop 5G in Earth and in space, the satellites. So www.5gspaceappeal.org, you can sign this petition. And as of November 6th, 172,395 signatures were on this. You can do it easily online. People from 204 countries and territories, including 4,500 scientists, 8,000 engineers, and over 22,000 healthcare workers. So it's a growing group that is um, signing and making their intent known. Again, this is a small thing you can all do and just take a minute out of your time. But we need to do more. Now, here are some extreme views on 5G. People have asked me um, about these things. And these are on websites, and you can watch videos and read documents that others have written, not me, but others. Some say that 5G is about total surveillance. And if you consider that you'll have an internet of things with smart appliances and smart everything, that everybody will know exactly what you're doing at all times with your appliances and your devices. That's certainly true. And what are they going to do with that information? Well, they might sell it to advertisers, or they may profile you. They'll certainly know where you are. And what you're doing with whatever. 
Uh, it's like China in a way, you know. I've been to China. I've watched uh, how they operate in their total surveillance state. Um, with facial recognition towers, people wear masks. And some people say, oh, that's when they have a cold. Well, you know, they wear those masks much more frequently than when they have a cold. They're covering their faces because they're tired of the, vi the video recognition. That's what I think. And I think it's coming here, maybe not in terms of face, but um, in terms of your behavior and your connection with all the, the smart grid. And some have written, and Stephen Hawking made an interesting quote before he died. He said, artificial intelligence may spell the end of the human race. That was an interesting statement that he made. And there's quite a debate about AI and what will happen when we start introducing more sophisticated robots in our world. Um, and if you want to see some of these robots, I recommend you go to YouTube and look up Sophia. And take a look at Sophia, this beautiful female-faced robot, uh, being interviewed by journalists and making interesting, seemingly independent statements, uh, independent of her programming. Uh, these things will be entering society in about five years, according to Silicon Valley and other makers. And so how, that, how is that going to impact our world? And they may be operating by 5G, because they could be controlled by the wireless. So um, depopulation agenda, it's another uh, idea about this. And there's another website there where you can watch videos. Um, certainly, it's not good for our health. Um, so uh, and it's part of, seemingly part of other onslaughts. Others have talked about targeted individuals, and that's a whole thing in itself. Um, some people feel that they're being victimized by some invisible electromagnetic things. Um, I don't know much about this. Again, it's a technology that, I, that goes beyond the level of academic science that I've been trained in. But, but I believe there may be a level of science beyond the academic level that I know. Um, that is uh, held by another sector of our, our society that uh, maintains it so. And then there's possibility of directed energy weapons. Again, uh, I don't know much about this uh, because it's beyond my academic scientific training, but there's material on the internet on these things. And there's an interesting video by Sasha Stone that you can watch for free online. I highly recommend it. It's called 5G Apocalypse, the Extinction Event. So that's free and online. And he makes a case that this is going to make life extinct on this planet. It's not a, a very happy video, but it's maybe an, an important video to view and think about. So the last part of my talk is now the other side of the coin, how to stay healthy in the wireless digital age. Strategies to stay healthy, and I'll go into details. So you need to know your exposure. You need to have a meter. You need to measure it. And you need to especially look at the places in your home and workplace where you spend the most time, where you sleep, where you sit at a desk, in an office or home, or where you work. And then you need to reduce your exposure to wireless. If you're smart, you're going to do this because the doses are cumulative. Why wouldn't you? And then you need to use protective measures that are scientifically and medically validated. And I suggest also grounding yourself using earthing. And I was happy to see that the earthing movie is playing or played last night. Uh, it's one of the films here at this very conference. So I suggest you watch it or to, rev to watch websites on earthing. And I have some, uh, some sites later on. And I suggest you replace your wireless router with wired routers. And we have instructions on how you may do that. Now, you can simply retain our routers from the past that as long as they have that old Ethernet DSL cable. We never got a Wi-Fi router where I live. We always maintain our older one. It still works fine. And we did this for our work as well as our home. So we just didn't go along with the wireless. And you know, wireless isn't that safe in terms of hacking. You know, somebody could be near, parked near your house and access your wireless router. And they could hack into your password. And then they could get into your system and really get into your bank accounts and things. I mean, who wants this? When you have something wired, it's more secure. 
That's just how it is. It's also faster. Why they sold us that wireless would be faster, I don't have a clue. But I know my wired internet is faster. And that's a gift. I mean, everybody wants fast. So I recommend this meter if you want to just measure Wi-Fi. This is good up through 4G, but it won't help you with 5G. It's called the Cornet ED88T+. And it's about $180. I like it because it shows one minute. That little LCD screen will show you the pulsations that happened in one minute. You really get the idea of how your digital electronics is uh, doing the pulsing and uh, on and off behavior. It will also indicate with a little colored light. Here it shows a little yellow. Uh, when you're in the red zone, you're definitely in a bad zone. And when you're in the green zone, that's most safe. And the yellow zone is a warning. Uh, in case you didn't know anything about the values uh, on this meter. And you can, uh, I believe, run it in the wattage uh, pr protocol or the decibel protocol. They're two different engineering ways to measure waves. So in 5G, this would just show its maximum value? It's no, it's not going to work in 5G. It's not. No. It will work for some of the very low frequencies of 5G. They're going to start rolling out the lowest frequencies first. So for about a year or so, you're going to be able to use this meter. This meter will continue to work for 4G, but the implementation of 5G also involves the densification of 4G. Because actually, 4G signals uh, travel further and penetrate more. Um, so they're going, to they're going to actually let 5G antennas deliver 4G as well. And just with the software switch, they can make them do both. So it's really, a, it's really a way to get 4G in our residential areas and our school neighborhoods. Uh, it's very clever, yeah. So now um, we want to make a 5G meter because uh, there isn't one for the people. You need $150,000 to buy one, or you can rent a giant piece of apparatus that you need a PhD and more to run from companies that will rent it for about $1,000 a month. And then you're going to really need to know how to run it. So good luck. There is no handheld meter like this. This is our design. And we're going to have, you know, we're able to see 2G, 3G, 4G, or all the frequencies of 5G on it. So you know what you've got. That's our strategy. But this is something we're seeking funding to build at this time. So the second thing you need to do is reduce your exposure to wireless and, and prudent avoidance. You need to keep your phone at least an inch away from your body at all times. That means not holding it to your head. That means not putting it in your pocket. Unless it's in airplane mode. Airplane mode, the phone becomes like a brick, as they say in engineering. It's, it's not doing anything. It's like off, hard off. Turning your phone off does not really turn it off, as I said earlier. It only puts it in communication with the global position satellite. And it's constantly blipping radio frequencies up to the satellite. So, and I suggest you use a computer to do your banking and more frequent work and keep your computer wired rather than use a cell phone or tablet, if possible. And return or man maintain your wired Ethernet DSL because Wi-Fi is exposing you all the time, whether you're using it or not. I suggest you eliminate deck phones or remove the um, the wireless connection in your decked phone uh, so that it operates like a, a landline without um, constantly blipping all the time. You can eliminate a wireless mouse and keyboard. You can go back to wired, especially in your workstations. And whenever else you can use wired technology, go back to wires. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, she asked whether wired headphones or that uh, earbuds that have metal wires, it's certainly true that wires act as antennas. So do my eyeglasses. These have to go. I'm looking for wood. <laughs> because the plastic ones still have a wire here, and this is all an antenna. So do the wires in bras. If you have a bra with an underwire, get rid of it. Or at least remove the wire. Yeah. So, um, so the, the earbuds. Yeah, let me say something about that. Now, there's two types of earbuds. Um, well, they're not just earbuds. There's two types of ways of using 
uh, a headphone set. One has wires and the other one doesn't. The other one has little pipes like straws that carry sound to your ears. And I don't know the names of those. Um, it's a brand, but you can look for that. Maybe it's called air tubes. So, um, so think wire technology whenever possible, but get rid of wires on your clothes and on your eyeglasses. I mean, if you really get serious about this, you'd really get rid of metal eyeglasses and uh, plastic without metal in it, or wood. So um, now, there are devices, there are things you can do in your environment. You could put, if you're stuck with a smart meter and you can't get rid of it, you could put shielding around it. You could put what's called a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage would be metal netting, and it blocks the RF. Then it won't work in the smart grid, and it may not work at all as a smart meter. I mean, the power company may then come by and say, the thing's not working. I don't know. I've never done that. I retained my old analog meter. Uh, and I, it's different in every state what your situation is with smart meters. So, um, I mean, if you were to shield your phone or your thing, it just wouldn't work. If you put your phone in a metal box and close the lid, it doesn't, and then try to call it, it doesn't work. That means it's shielded. Yeah. So, um, now, if you really want to get serious about this, and if you have electrosensitivity, you want to wear shielded clothing like a shirt that might protect your vital organs, or a hoodie. They have these things, and they have silver threads in them. But they look kind of like normal clothes. Uh, so you can buy this stuff. And here's a place to get it, lessemf.com. I'm not, that's not my website or anything. It's just one among many. But I noticed they had a, a large selection, so I'm bringing it out. And um, there are some devices that you can use in your smartphones. Now, a lot of people I know have this little sticker of some sort on the back of their phone and say, hey, I'm fine, I've got this little sticker, see? And I can do this, and I'm totally protected. Really? Show me the evidence. This is irresponsible, in my opinion, that companies sell gizmos like this to stick on the back of your phone when I haven't read peer-reviewed independent studies showing me the evidence. I haven't seen a single independent publication on any of these devices. And yet people are convinced and operate as if they're totally safe because they have some sticker or gizmo plastered on the side of their phone. So I think that's irresponsible. Now, Dr. Klinghardt, Dietrich Klinghardt is a holistic physician in Seattle. And he's quite involved with electrosensitivity. And he put people in an electromagnetically shielded environment and then assessed their behavior and performance. He just did a little tiny study. And these were normal folks. They said, I don't have electrosensitivity. Nah, nothing. And guess what? Their concentration was better. They could perform better. And they said, yeah, we feel better. You know, we have so forgotten how it feels because we're like the frogs in hot water. You know, if you put frogs in water and then you turn up the heat, they slowly adapt and they don't recognize they're being slowly cooked. Now, if you start with boiling water and throw frogs in that, they'll hop out. The problem is we're being slowly cooked, and we don't recognize it. We're slowly poisoned along the way. And uh, that was a very interesting experiment he did, covering the head and vital organs of people with protective clothing, and then they felt better and could perform. So here's some of the stuff um, shown to you, the products, caps like this that have... Uh, block with the radiation if you want to protect your brain. Um, experiment, um, emergency equipment like a poncho like this or a tent with mylar, you know, it's aluminum built into the plastic would help shield. Now it's unclear whether these shield 100%, but they do block some. I haven't tested them with a meter on the inside. I, don't, I didn't bought these things. There's the mosquito type netting that's made out of metal mesh that uh, you would put around your whole bed. Uh, to block the radiation from coming in that you might find better to sleep, and the hoodie with um, the silver threads. So those are just some items that you can buy. There's also the electromagnetic paint. Mm -hmm. And again, um, lessemf.org sells such paint that has metal in it. It's very expensive. Now here's something you should not do if you decide to paint your home like this. Then you should never operate with wireless equipment inside a zone where you put the shielding. Why? 
because they're going to bounce right off the shielding and intensify and come back to you at double strength, if not worse. Ditto with sitting in a car operating a cell phone, because the car is metal. And the car then, you know, you get the frequencies through the windows, and then it's going to bounce from the metal car right back to you and get intensified. That's not a good idea. So if you're going to do a room like your bedroom, then never operate a cell phone in that room where you've painted with shielding paint. Then you operate in other rooms with your wireless device, not your bedroom. Or you're just undoing the whole effect. Well, you know, I think you, you came in late because I've given already an hour and a half on that earlier. But if you want to hear that story, then you come to my lecture tomorrow to hear the short version where I'll summarize all of that. Okay? Because I'm not going to go back and repeat that. I only have so much time. I have to watch my time. We have 30 more minutes. Now, we saw this in China. Um, I've been to Asia quite a bit, and there's some interest there in this issue, but not by the government. Um, we saw that they had sold, companies sell, electromagnetic shielded aprons for pregnant women. I thought, that's a great idea. I never saw this in the United States. I don't see it at lessemf.org. I hope somebody makes them. And it, they, it's an apron all the way around the body. So they're shielding. It's like a jumper. So there's little straps, and then around the whole body is this little dress. It's like a lead apron. It's sort of like uh, serious shielding for the fetus in the womb, because the developing organisms are the most affected by any radiation. That's known in biology. Everything under development. Think thalidomide. Think what happened in the 1960s from people exposed to the drugs their mother took for nausea. They, these babies were born with malformed limbs, no limbs, in the 1960s. It was unbelievable horrific. So we know developing organisms are always the most sensitive to chemicals as well as radiation. And we should shield our, our offspring. Now, there are products that boost the biofield. I actually have studied a couple of these and published mm -hmm. papers on them. And these are the two that I mentioned here. There may be others, but there are. Um, these were definitely done. And I'm an independent scientist. I'm not selling these things. Uh, one is the Q-Link. The Q-Link actually is an old piece of technology. It came before wireless. But recent uh, studies that I've looked at seem to indicate that it's at least partly protecting us. I haven't seen anything that really fully protects people that you wear as a gizmo around your neck, uh, like sympathetic resonance technology or quantum field technology. The Amaskua Chi Pen and 3 is from Hong Kong. I have not seen it marketed in the United States. Uh, the Q-Link is marketed, I think, worldwide, and you can find it online. And what happens with these? It's not shielding anything. It's boosting the human energy field. It's strengthening it so that you have more resilience and resistance to stress. That's how they work. There may be others at work. Here was the study I did. This was a very interesting thing. And then it, it uh, no longer is being sold because of investment issues. Um, it's quite possible that there are beneficial frequencies. And this was an app that delivered via um, over the internet, it delivered frequencies to you through your cell phone. And it had a positive effect on heart rate variability in testing that I did. And the study was done very rigorously. I had two phones, one of which had the real app and one of which had a mock app. And I didn't know which was which. There was blinded and then double blinded because the people I studied didn't know which was which. And we studied 20 people with two different phones and different dates at the same time of day. And I studied their hearts. And I looked to see what happened with heart rate variability. And guess what? The app improved heart rate variability, which means resilience to stress is improved. That's a very good finding. Unfortunately, this, you know how apps are? They sell for a couple bucks. And there's, uh, they're here today. And then you know, people lose track of them because there's a bunch of apps being um, introduced every day. And then they just become part of the background. You don't even hear about them anymore. Unless you have a giant marketing muscle out there, people can't find your app. They don't know about it. This is one company that had that situation. So it doesn't exist anymore. But it showed me that your wireless device might be programmable with beneficial frequencies. 
That's what it showed. So maybe there's a way to turn this around. If we can figure out which of the frequencies among this giant electromagnetic spectrum may be helpful for us, then we can put those in our environment and possibly counteract the negative effects of the other frequencies which were not selected to be particularly beneficial. Well, it worked through the internet. And you know, as long as you have wireless operating on your phone, then it was working. That was how this thing operated. It worked passively. You didn't have to fiddle with it. You just turn on the app and forget about it. But the thing doesn't exist anymore. So that's the statement. Here's my publication, Journal of Alternative Combinatory Medicine, 2017. You can read it. So I'm really concerned about all the so so-called protected devices for cell phones. People have asked me what works. And I don't have the money to compare them. It would be a very good thing to compare them. Generally, if there's any money made available, people say, OK, here's my gizmo. How much do you want for studying it? OK, I'll study it. And I take some small amount of money. And I do it, and then I put it out there. Generally, they just want a couple people looked at. They can't afford a real study with 10 to 15 to 20 people. That's too bad, because when just a couple people are looked at, that's not really a serious study, and we don't know if it's going to work for everybody all of the time. If we had a little bit larger study, we could generalize to the population as a whole. So most of them are marketed without adequate study. That's a fact. And we don't have any comparative studies, no funding. I'm looking for funding to do that. If you know of any sources, this would be a very good thing. We need to know what works best, or whether things work in combination to protect us. Because I suspect that 5G is going to be rolled out in some form, and we're going to have more of this. And even if not, we need to deal with 4G. It's going to stay around. I don't see that going anywhere. Uh, and we lack peer-reviewed publications. In order to publish in the peer-reviewed literature, you can't just study two to three people. You need to make a serious scientific study, like I did with blindedness, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way I want to do science. I know. I know what good science is. I don't want to do some half-baked thing on two to three people without controls. It's, it's, it's a slap in the face to me as a scientist to, to be asked to do that. But if they don't have the funding, I'll take a look at it. I'll do that. But then I can't publish it. Then they run to their website and they say, look, we've got something. That's bad. It's not adequate. I looked at six, study, six devices using my blood bioassay that I spoke about in the other hour. And some of them work partially to protect our blood from uh, radiation. But I didn't see anything that worked 100%. That's too bad. So there seems to be partial protection, but I haven't found anything definitive. And we need the funding to look further, more deeply into this. And I could employ a number of laboratories around the world that I have access to with colleagues. We could make a definitive study and get to the bottom of what's going to protect us if only we had the money. I'm putting that out there because we need this money. It's a serious thing that we protect ourselves. Now, here's something else you can do. You can opt out of your smart meter in most places. You might have to pay a little extra to do that for a while. You can shield your home with protective paint, inside or out, but it's a very expensive endeavor. You can turn off your electric power every night, or you can turn off your Wi-Fi power. You can have it on a timer so it automatically goes off. I think children should not use wireless devices. We should reconsider what we're doing in schools with industrial strength Wi-Fi and handing kindergartners uh, tablets now to, to learn uh, things instead of handing them picture books. And with baby monitors, we should look toward Europe and only use wired versions. The American versions are all wireless. It's wrong. The Wi-Fi is right near the baby in a crib. What are we thinking? So here's something else you can do. You can do earthing. And it's something I need to do because I've been flying a lot lately. I've got to get my feet bare and out, and out there before it's too cold later tonight. <laughs> uh, barefoot in the ground at least 10 to 15 minutes. Or use earthing shoes or earthing sheets or earthing clothes uh, that are shielded and also connected to ground. Some people connect this to the third terminal on your um, your outlets, but I think sometimes that ground is not good enough, so you want to go connect outside, which is better, the uh, rod into the real physical ground. And there's studies on earthing, and people sleep better, they have less pain, they have reduced stress, 
they have improved immune function, and there was one study showing that it may combat electromagnetic field stress. Only one study, but again, the funding in this area is pretty scanty. So I think we would do very well to get grounded and spend time with barefoot on earth every day, whether it's on the grass or sand or soil. So some of you are gardeners and farmers, put your bare feet in the ground or touch the earth with bare hands. Again, we usually wear gloves, but we can take off the gloves. Here's another thought that I have about this whole field. Um, and this is just our, our thought, maybe it's a hypothesis. I have a feeling that we're being called to raise our vibration as human beings to deal with this. And if we could, and if we do, and by doing so via meditation or yoga or qigong or the spiritual mind-body practices of our ancestors, I think we may offset some of the negative health effects of EMFs. And we need to cultivate an enduring state of love and joy despite all of this going on in our environment and all around us. We need to come together as a humanity and hang in there and uh, thrive and persevere. And if we were to cultivate a, an enduring state of love and joy, uh, I think we raise our vibration and we can overcome stressors. That I can tell you. There are many studies on positive psychology in the mind-body medicine literature that show that people who maintain a positive outlook, uh, a feeling of love and joy, can overcome terrible diseases, heal faster, etc. The data is out there. This is just one more thing in which we can raise our vibration and thrive. We also are working in our own laboratory in San Francisco Bay on subtle energy detectors that measure the biofield. And we have one detector that can sense, uh, shall I say, the dynamic emotional state of a person. This is a very interesting detector. We said about to measure chi, and certainly energy healers affect this detector and we see it registers, but it also registers when people are in a loving, uh, passionate state. And I think we can also then maybe train a higher vibrational state using such detectors. Here's our setup. So we're just, um, we're looking for further funding to carry this forward. We have a sensor suite monitoring the environment, monitoring many things in the human physiology, and then uh, measuring subtle energy from the person, from the biofield in different states of mind and spirit. So in conclusion, Radiation from Wi-Fi, from wireless technology, poses a hazard to our health, and we're all at risk. Whether you're electrosensitive or not, we are all at risk. We can expect 5G to be more hazardous than 3 or 4G because it will be much more extensive and involves higher frequencies, such as the millimeter waves that were never used before widely on Earth. We need to take personal action through advanced self-care to protect ourselves whether that means keeping your phone on airplane mode most of the time and returning to more wired appliances. And I would say other measures like eating good foods, uh, organic, and uh, taking good care of ourselves, getting adequate sleep, et cetera, to reduce our stress chemicals. And we need to reduce our wireless exposure and use proven protective measures to improve our overall well-being. And the last thing I want to show you is this quote by Rudolf Steiner. Again, 100 years ago, he wrote this. The effect of radiant electricity on the people living in the midst of it will be that they will no longer be able to comprehend the news that is transmitted so quickly. Electricity gradually wipes out our comprehension. This effect is already noticeable today, 100 years ago. You can already see that people have a harder time comprehending things that come toward them than they did a few decades ago. Does this blow your mind or what? 100 years ago? Yes. Today we're on overload. People can hardly keep up with the news because it's coming at us so fast and furious. So here are my websites. And there's nothing really on this topic on my website. At present, we don't have any publications. We are working on a book on this, and we'll get it out hopefully soon. So now we can have discussion. 
I don't know about that. Um, that. That's a good question. Is there something in the international course about launching all these satellites? Uh, not that I know of, and I'm just not up on all the political scene. Uh, I'm a scientist, sorry. <laughs> okay, so he asked whether uh, people getting sick, I guess in groups at the American Embassy in Cuba might be related here. It's an interesting question. I don't know specifically about that, but I can tell you that in Moscow, when the Americans had an academy during the Cold War, our, our embassy during the Cold War, a lot of Americans working there got sick, and later it was found that the Russians were bombarding it with certain frequencies. So that was you know, during the Cold War, it was decades ago. So they knew quite a bit about that. Um, I think before the Americans understood the full ramifications. So they're using the non-thermal aspects to thwart health. And I don't know about this recent episode of Cuba. We need a few million dollars, but that's peanuts in terms of scientific research. So, so a few million is Yes, I would say in the order of five, five million dollars, we could make a lot of headway. There are a lot of devices out there, and we then would have to prioritize them and look seriously. We wouldn't study every one. Um, and there's more and more coming out all the time. People say, oh, there's this new thing. I think I'm fully protected now. I just put this thing in the back of my cell phone. And some people feel better doing it, and then you wonder, uh, well, is it a placebo effect? You know, there, are, there is the biology of belief, and that is strong. And it might work for a while as long as they believe that it's doing something, but we need to go beyond that. We need some serious evidence that something is either boosting the human energy field or otherwise uh, emitting a beneficial frequency that somehow allows us to deal with these other frequencies. So yes, we can study these things, but we need, say, five, maybe $10 million. Again, we need a, a worldwide concerted effort to do this. And I could work with a small group that, would, uh, that I know of interested people who are qualified to do this. And I, I'm in touch with scientists worldwide who would love to do it, but can't find any money. Well, that's a good question. Is there a system in place to collect the funding? No, but we could create one if we found a source. And certainly, you know, it could be a lot of nonprofit laboratories. Mine is a nonprofit, but university labs are nonprofits. So we don't want the industry doing it, and we don't want the companies making the devices to do the studies themselves. It always should be third party independent scientists who don't have financial interests, because that's the, the truest studies. The problem with the industrial studies on 4G and, and below, uh, were the industry studies or the studies funded by the industry have been shown to be, have different results in favor of the industry over independent studies. So we know that there's bias. And that's why we would like, I mean, if the industry wants to fund this, then why, don't, why doesn't the telecom industry put a pile of money together and we'll create an infrastructure that will manage the money that will be independent of them? We can easily mobilize the laboratories that I know and create uh, some kind of organization that will do it. But we want to maintain control so it's not, um, so it's allocated appropriately and, and utilized appropriately with, with the right controls. Like we would like uh, controlled double blind studies that have sufficient numbers to do statistics. That would be some of the criteria. So then we need mock devices and the real thing. They look the same, we can't tell what they are. They're labeled A and B, and somebody holds the key, and we do the study, and only after we have the results is it decoded so we know which group is which. That's how it should be done. And I know all those protocols, and so do all the other scientists who, serious scientists who want to study this, and then we're paralyzed, we, we can't do it, because it takes a lot of time and effort to run these studies. So I put that out there because you people may have connections or you may find people who are really concerned that we need to, to do this and we need to do it quickly because all health and life on Earth is affected. And we might be able to help the environment too. Maybe we can have active emitters of beneficial frequencies. Well, let me say that I ran studies on these and I have peer-reviewed publications on the Q-Link. In 2002, I, I did a study. And recently I did... Um, a smaller study, which I didn't publish, but I showed that it protected against Wi-Fi. And, and the other one, um, I, I did work for this Hong Kong company and showed some, some protection also. These are not total protections. Right. These are partial protections. Right. I mean, it's who's doing what. 
And I, I'll add that we're coming out with further products. I'm trying to develop products as well. Yes, because we understand now some of the deeper under science underlying some of these in terms of biofield. Um, and so we can develop uh, products with this understanding. Well, we don't know how, you know, what kind of power will come out of those satellites. They haven't turned them on yet. They've mm -hmm. launched so, so many already. Oh, but they haven't turned them on. So we don't know how it's going to be. We're just waiting to see. When are they turning them on? Well, I don't know. 2020, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the satellites are still being approved and going up. And I know we have five minutes left. Um, and it's really hard to say what kind of power these things are going to deliver. I think you know they're going to tr they're going to introduce the low frequencies first in 5G and then ramp up to the higher frequencies. Here's another thing about 5G: the chipsets for the very high frequencies, like 90 uh, gigahertz, are extremely expensive. But as things get mass produced over the next few years, they're going to come down in price. So if you try to buy a 5G device that will emit 90 gigahertz, it would cost a fortune right now. So they're not going to roll that out right away. They're going to roll out the lower uh, level frequencies where the chipsets are cheaper. So actually, the other chipsets are still being developed and figured out. So this 5G rollout will take maybe five to 10 years. By that time, they'll be on to 6G. And 6G, guess what, is about uh, hooking the human in with devices like, you know, the matrix, uh, back of the neck, or... <laughs> That's the plans for 6G. They're already talking about it. They work on things decades ahead. Well, I suggest you read Rudolf Steiner if you want to hear about the degradation of life with electricity. I give you a little snippet from some of his writings. He's got a lot of interesting material. And it, the question remains, how is our quality of life improved? Well, I would say we can talk to people on the other side of the world. I have a lot of connections in China. I get on my phone. I have the app WeChat. That's the Chinese app the government approves over there. And I talk to China. And I can do face-to-face -face talks with China. OK, but I'm, I don't know what my neighbor's up to. <laughs> right next door, I don't know what he's up to. I'm busy talking to China. So we're dissociated locally from our environments very frequently with this kind of things. We're dissociated from ourselves. You know? But we have certain, we've gained certain uh, abilities. And I won't say more about that. You, know, you, you evaluate whether your quality of life has improved or not. It's, uh, everybody feels the treadmill. We have a treadmill of work from the emails, the, the numbers of communications, the sheer numbers that we have to, are expected to respond to are overwhelming. If you just get through your email every day, it's like, oh, finally I can get into work. It's like, doesn't it feel like that? You know, finally now I can get down to work because I've got my communications, at least for the moment, dealt with. And, and then there's more. It's rolling in all day and all night because you're connected to the world. And that's how it is every day, the treadmill. Well, I think we've probably run out of time. It's time for lunch, so we can continue the discussion. Thank you.